The Dominic Mills Podcast is brought to you by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Dominic Mills Podcast. We're going to start today's episode off with some news. Starting off in science, a coral the size of a carousel has been discovered in the Great Barrier Reef. While only the sixth tallest coral in the reef, it is a standalone coral, which is incredibly rare. Named Muga Dombi, it's estimated to be over 400 years old meaning it has survived and endured as as many as 80 cyclones and over 99 coral bleaching events. This is significant because in recent years, the amount of coral bleaching events in the reef has many scientists worried about the effect climate change and rising water temperatures have on the Great Barrier Reef, and the existence of Mugadambi may point to some reefs being more resilient than previously thought. Moving to space, back in February, NASA's Perseverance rover touched down on Mars and has since been pretty busy. It has seen the first flight of the Martian Ingenuity helicopter, which to this point has taken 12 flights across the planet's surface. The rover's landing site may include a volcanic lava flow from long ago or potentially show signs of an earlier episode of water. Perseverance took a picture in a part of the Gerezo Delta and the tilted layers of sedimentary rock and cement-like mixtures of coarse sand and pebbles confirm the wet history. There are also individual large boulders cemented into the front of the Delta Scarp, suggesting the region saw high floods, according to Perseverance Deputy Project Scientist Katie Stack Morgan of NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. And in sports, Nerlens Noel of the New York Knicks is suing super agent slash CEO Rich Paul of Clutch Sports. Back in 2017, Noel was a free agent and had received an offer of four years, $70 million from the Dallas Mavericks when Paul approached Noel and told him he was a $100 million man. He allegedly ensured that only he could get him that level of payday, but he would need to fire his current agent and decline the offer from the Mavericks first. So Noel went ahead and accepted a one-year, $4.1 million deal and spent much of the subsequent season on the sidelines, recovering from a torn ligament in his thumb and he's been a minimum salary player ever since. Noel then says he felt abandoned by Paul in favor of his more high-profile clients and that Paul was actively ignoring calls about Noel from the Philadelphia 76ers, Houston Rockets, and Los Angeles Clippers. The two sides parted ways in 2020. Clutch Sports filed a grievance against Noel for allegedly failing to pay his commission fee to Paul on the first contract with the Knicks, and Noel responded with a lawsuit. That's all for the news. If you're interested in learning more, I'll have links in the show notes. Now let me tell you a little about today's amazing guest. Joe Lewis is an extremely talented, multifaceted musician from Kalamazoo, Michigan, who has proven to be a force in the music industry, working with many of the biggest names across multiple genres, including Maroon 5, Bando Pop, Hit Boy, Bria Lee, the Kalamazoo Symphony Orchestra, and Dave Mack. His rare talents paved the way for him to be the executive producer and engineer of Anything by Dave Mack, which became the number one album in Canada in 2019. He is also a performer in his latest single, Forsaken, and all of his other tracks can be found on Spotify, Apple Music, and wherever else you listen to music. We discuss his journey and early success in the music industry, his inspirations, his upcoming TV show, and much more. We have a bit of an audio issue towards the end when his headphones die, but it's only a momentary problem. Now, before we begin, let's blast that intro. with uh, Joe Lewis. Joe, thank you so much for joining me. So, um, you know, very rarely can we say that 
somebody is just uniquely talented at something, whether it be science, school, for you, it's music. I mean, the background that you have is astonishing. Um, Would you say that you were born to have a career in music? Actually, yes. Um, But I didn't always know it. You know, for me, music was, I I grew up in the church playing the drums. And since the age of two, you know, music has just been something that has always been inside of me. You talk to my mom and dad, they'll tell you that I was running around the house banging pots and pans. And, but you know, just through life, I never really took it serious. So I was in band classes, but that's really as far as uh, me taking music seriously would go. And because I'm from a small town, we don't have the resources or the know-how that you can have a career in music. So it took me, you know, until I was 20 to say, okay, I'm going to try music out. But by then, I probably tried out four or five different career paths in different ways. So it took a while to get there, in my opinion. But I do believe that you know, I was born with music just you know, inside of me and I was supposed to be doing it. Yeah, I mean, you were able to do some of the live audio engineering stuff at 10 years old for your church. I, I don't think, like, that, that just is insane to me. Like, I couldn't even... I, I was still probably picking boogers out of my nose when I was 10. Like, there's there no way I could have done anything like that. Um, I also... Oh, no, no, go ahead. That came from... So I grew up in the church playing the drums, and then my father started his own church. But it was a very small church, and we didn't have any musicians. And the only thing that I could do around music was to learn how to work the audio system. So I kind of started doing that out of not being able to play the drums because we didn't have a, a band for the church. And, you know, it kind of became a normal thing. I had no idea. And so I went to college so, and I was like, yeah, I know most of this stuff, but I didn't know how. And I, I typed out a small bio for a class. And I was like, well, I've been doing this for since I was 10, kind of a long time. But it started to kind of make sense why I, um, I enjoyed it so much because Audio engineering is kind of the science nerdy part of music, and I thought I wanted to do all the fun stuff, you know, just making mm-hmm. music, making music, things like that. But, you know, that um took me by surprise too when I kind of put everything together about you know just being a kid wanted to do something and be as close to music in the church as I could. Yeah, um, and I feel like you being able to I don't know just playing around with stuff is. I don't know, did, did, I've read that also that you were able to learn a lot of different instruments, like just by ear. Like, do you think that yeah. a lot of that like can contributed to that? Oh, definitely. Um, when I was a kid, I think I had I had three piano teachers. The first two could not figure out how to teach me, and because you know, as a kid, you don't know how to um, translate what you know in layman's terms. So I didn't know that I knew how to play by ear. I just, you know, the, the teacher would play something and I would play it back without reading. And they couldn't figure out how to get me to read what I was doing. And the first teacher was confused, so they gave me to a better one. That teacher was just as confused. And it wasn't until my third teacher, and she was like, you know, Joe plays by ear, and that's why the other teachers had a hard time, but they couldn't figure it out. You know, she was a very good teacher. And unfortunately, I think I only had her for like, four months because she moved out of the state. And after that, all of my lessons stopped classically. And I just, you know, just started doing what I knew. And it's kind of like, um, I don't mean to sound cliche, but it's a lot like off the, uh, the movie Drumline, where if I hear it, I can mimic it. But I never knew what I was doing. So I didn't learn how to read music until my seventh grade year in middle school. And even then, it was very hard, but it took a, a really good teacher because I tried to trick all of my teachers. And because, you know, for me, it was kind of lazy, but if I know it, why do I need to read it? And I wasn't understanding the importance of reading music. So, and learning how to read took way too much time. I was still playing sports, and I'm a kid. You know, it didn't really, didn't really seem fun. 
So if I could trick my teacher, I would trick him. And it took my second grade teacher to realize that um, I couldn't read. Because I would, you know, say, I, I might mess up when I was playing the drums. And they said, no, Joe, that's wrong. I said, oh, how does it go? And they, they go, tap, da, 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 da. So I just played it back however they did it. And mm. I would go from there. But it, it took, uh, his name was Mr. Stout. He was a cool dude. But once he, cause I did that to him. And he looked at me. And he said, Joe, play this, whatever. And I couldn't play it. He said, you can't read music. I said, no. And he started to pull me out of my other classes. Like, he would take me out of math class and teach me how to read music. Um, but playing my ear was something that I used to be ashamed of. But I learned how to embrace it. You know, kind of like a person who can speak but can't read. Mm -hmm. That speaks pretty well. And became with the most intelligent conversations. Just couldn't write it down. I had to learn how to embrace that creatively. So I used to be very jealous of people who could read music or who could understand um, classical theory. Yeah, I'm, but I'm sure that those same people who could read music but couldn't just pick up something and mimic it perfectly like you would be able to probably felt the exact same way. Like they find yeah. out Joe can't Joe can't read music, but Joe plays the drums way better than I do. I'm sure they were they'd get upset about that pretty often. And, and that's what made me appreciate um, learning how to, uh, I'm sorry, that's what made me appreciate playing by ear. I had a friend and his theory was through the roof. If you said, hey, play me a jazz song or a pop song or make me something, he knew exactly the formula to do it. And I was very jealous of that because because of my skill, if I knew formulas, I would be done with the song in five minutes. But instead, I had to feel it out and let my ear do its job. and I remember he was telling me, like, yo, I wish I could do what you do. I'm like, bro, I want to do what you do. Like, this isn't always easy, you know, playing by ear. But seeing that we both had appreciations for one another's gift, you know, really allowed me to see, like, hey, it's not bad to be like this. Just embrace it as much as you can and use that to learn how to read music and theory. So I try to use it to my advantage as much as possible. Yeah, for sure. And I'm sure it helps you, like, see it in a way that somebody who doesn't have that skill wouldn't would never be able to appreciate the same way yeah. and you know what it's like being able to feel it and not necessarily like know what exactly it is that you're doing so what once you figured it out i bet it's like key in whole like you, you knew exactly like that it was something that you would love um yeah. how how many instruments do you play so that the instruments that i can read only the drums. I, I can read any types of rhythm, um, but my ear, I know how to play the piano, the saxophone, the bass. I can't really play guitar, but I, I would pick up you know, any instrument that I could find and kind of just mess around with it. And that's how I knew that I could play the instrument. I just need to, I needed to know technique. But in terms of getting a sound out, I can get a sound out of probably any instrument if I know how that instrument works, you know? So uh, when I was in the fourth grade, I learned how to play the stand-up bass in orchestra class. And then I learned the saxophone in fifth, and fifth grade. And then I got into the drums. But, you know, meeting in band class, everybody has instruments. So I just you know, learned how to mess around with it. And at least I learned that if I could get three notes, I can make a song. I, or I could at least do something with that sound. So I just learned how to, you know, the, the technical part of the instrument. And uh, so for me, if somebody asks me, I can play any instrument as long as I can sit with it for a little bit to figure out how the instrument works and how you should properly play it. I might not know what I'm playing, and it might take me a lot of tries to get the right notes in order, but uh, I'll figure it out at some point. Hmm. That That's amazing, That you, especially that you were able to have, like, orchestra classes so young. I think where I grew up, I grew up in Ohio and the only time, like when we were in seventh grade, I believe we had the choice of either band and it was just you could probably regular instruments or, or choir. And I remember my older brother played trumpet and that was the most annoying thing in the world to hear him <laughs> playing his trumpet horribly all day long. So I made the quick decision to to hop in the choir and just stand in the back and not really do anything like that. Oh, I can't sing. I don't want to make it seem like I can sing. <laughs> but it, it was it was the lesser of two evils for me. Okay. 
Yeah, I seen I seen the Ohio State flag. I'm from Michigan. Yeah, yeah. I, I was I was gonna I was gonna say I know you played for Western Michigan, but you know if you uh if you lived in Michigan, you know, you probably got a big old M somewhere up in your house. <laughs> my my baby sister actually just graduated from U of M going into her doctor's program to be a OBGYN. Mm. So and they have like a phenomenal a, school. Yeah, not, not to get off topic, but Michigan's hospitals are very they're the, one of the best in the states. I had a cousin who had a heart condition, and Michigan was one of the only hospitals in the country that could serve that could serve him correctly. So Michigan is very on point when it comes to hospital things. Medical. Yeah. But you know, while while we're on football, um, what what was your experience like playing over at uh, Western Michigan? I know you got to play with uh, or under PJ Fleck, who's over at uh, Minnesota now. What was that like? Very humbling. Um, it that's honestly the only thing that I can say is that it, it humbled me a lot. So, being from where I'm from, I was a I wouldn't call myself a star football player because I, I didn't have a star role. I was a defensive lineman, you know, so I wasn't a quarterback or running back. But I was probably the best player on my team and one of the better players in the area. So. You know, when you're good at something, you kind of walk around with your chest out. You think you're unstoppable. And when I was doing the recruiting process, one thing that I learned about myself was I was too short for my position. So I had the width, the size, and the uh, the size from a weight standpoint, but I was too short. And a lot of coaches would tell me, hey, Joe, you're a good player, but you're too short for us to even look at your film. We won't consider you. And when I finally got to Western, it was – I honestly like a dream come true to be able to play in my hometown because as a kid, all you want to do is play at Western. We would go to the Western football games with our rocket teams, and you always want to play at Waldo Stadium being from Kalamazoo. But when I got there, I seen these huge players. And Western isn't, it's a mid sized Division One school. So the athletes there aren't top tier. They're, they're good, but these players are way bigger than me. So I, I was put in situations where I was normally never leaving the football field in a game, playing offense and defense. To I had to work very hard just to make the practice squad, and that was very mentally challenging to learn how to deal with to work this hard and go through all these changes to fit the program just to not practice. You know, I at least wanted to practice, but you know, I, it was very humbling to not be the person uh, who was important to the team from a game standpoint. And it taught me that, you know, practice players are needed. So it, it taught me to play my play my role and um, play my role well and also get better. But uh, from a, aside from it really humbling my ego, it was great to play under Coach Fleck. I, I honestly think that Coach Fleck would be one of the greatest, if not the greatest college football coach by the time he's done. To see what he's able to do with young men and the things that he's teaching, I mean, I, I still use the things that I, I, I was taught by him every single day um, in terms of his program. The way he was able to do with Western in a matter of four years is crazy. You know, Western, we never would have thought that Western Michigan could play in a Cotton Bowl, especially three years prior to their one and eleven. You know, Coach Fleck is very high energy. Um, he's very honest. You know, and he actually taught me the the difference between business and personal, even though sometimes they, they seem to clash depending on what industry you're in. And I remember my, my last year playing football, I only played for two years before I learned that I wanted to do music. And because of, before I started making music, I had insomnia just because I didn't know I was a creative kid. So when you're on a school schedule, you're, you're on a school schedule. I could never fall asleep. When I got to college, the workouts were so intense that I would fall asleep. And then I got used to it, and I, my insomnia would kick back in. And the insomnia on top of the excitement of learning music made it so that I could not fall asleep in time to wake up at 6 in the morning for a workout. I'm sorry, 5 in the morning. So I, I would be late multiple times. My grades were slipping because I wanted to make music, um, and I wasn't taking any musical classes. So... I wasn't performing well in class, wasn't performing well in practice, falling asleep in the practice meetings. 
Um, just not focused the way I should be if I'm a part of a football team and not focused the way that I normally would be for football. And I remember we ha- I had an exit meeting with him. And this was the meeting that you had with your coach right before we had winter break. And I could tell by his face, he just wanted to chew me out. He wanted, like, he couldn't wait till I got in the meeting for him to say, like, Joe, you are r- wrong in everything. Like, you need to get everything together if you want to be on this team. And he looked at me. He said, Joe, is there anything that you want to say before I say what I have to say? I said, Coach, I won't be here next year. I'm, I'm going to go pursue music. I, I got it accepted into Western Music Program. But I believe that music is what I should be doing and not football. He crossed out everything on his paper. He had this huge smile on his face. He said, Joe, you let me know when you make it. I want people to know that I know you and that I coach you. I wish you the best. I mean, he, he had nothing but kind words to say. And to me, that was a, the first time I was able to see a fine line between business and personal because college football is a business. And I wasn't operating in the business correctly. I was bad for business um, because it was just I, I wasn't right. I'm just going to be honest. I wasn't doing the right things to be a part of that program. But when he seen that I was going to do something that was personally right for me, he congratulated me, was happy for me, and he let the business go. And that wasn't something that I had ever seen before. I'm used to everything either being personal or business. But uh, I appreciate Coach Fleck dearly. I think he's a great guy. Um, and his, even his practice philosophy is just energy. You know, one thing that I always tell people, because I, I consult people from time to time, and they always want to know how to get things going. Where should they start? And the first thing I say is you have to start somewhere and you have to build momentum. And sometimes you have to build the momentum yourself. It, it, it doesn't happen. And once you get some momentum, things will start to come because of law of attraction and this energy. And we would have this drill in football practice where we'd be practicing and it's called the momentum drill. He blows the whistle, we run over to the wall, we start making all this noise. We just for five to I'm sorry, not five seconds, for forty-five seconds to a minute, we're just ah, ah, clapping and we're making a lot of noise. And then he blows the whistle again, we have to run on the field and go back to practice. And all of a sudden our energy is picked up. At first we were forcing ourselves to create this momentum and build up, and then eventually it carried over because we had built created our own momentum. And that would translate over into the games as well. So it was, you know, small things like that that I learned from Coach Fleck that uh, I still carry every day. Um, and he's a great teacher. You know, he, the first thing that he, he gave us when you come onto the team is called a man manual. And it's about a, it's a binder about that thick. And it just has a bunch of inspirational quotes. These quotes are for money. These quotes are for when you're feeling like this. These quotes are if you're in this situation. And you don't see too many coaches who care about their players enough to make them a better person. You know, a lot of coaches just care about the game itself. So uh, I believe Coach Fleck would, would be uh, a force to be reckoned with in the college football scene. On top of he's young. You know, when I mm-hmm. played for him, he was the youngest college football coach, and people did not like him because, uh, you know, how he came across. You know, even from being in Kalamazoo, I would go to the store and I would have on a Western football shirt once I – have been recruited by them, and people go, "Oh, you're gonna play for Western? I can't stand that coach Fleck. What is what is roll the boat? What does this mean?" And you know, he had to deal with a lot of hatred th- those first couple of years, and then two, you know, four years later, everybody's saying roll the boat, and they're walking around. I'm sorry, That's okay. they're walking around, you know, doing the roll the boat motion. But uh, I think he's gonna be good. He he also showed me culture, and that culture and community is very important. Um, to, in anything that you're doing. And that I use that a lot in terms of when I wanted to get into the music industry. I had to learn how to build my own community of music, my own community and, and a network, and begin to grow my own culture, per se. I, I'm not a, um, I don't have a full team behind me, so my team doesn't have a culture, but I have to have a culture to myself to begin to implement so everybody else can fall in line when I do begin to work with more people there have a team behind me but uh i could talk about coach fleck all day man yeah yeah no i i'm entranced i I love hearing stuff like that about coaches that uh that teach you lessons and stuff like that like especially because 
coming from an area like that where you would be like the guy, like the sport, like, you know, when you're, when you're the guy, even I know you were saying Western's a, a mid, I think mid major is the word I'm looking for here. It's still division one and division one is division one. Those guys are, those guys are dudes. Um, yeah. And just having to claw and fight and scrap for everything you get, even that practice experience is just, I th- for you specifically, I think it really, you know, cause a lot of people after they graduate with their, with their degree music wise, they'll go and they'll join like a corporation of some sort, but you had like this, this idea of stuff that you wanted to go for and you just, you put all your effort into that. And I think it's been one of the biggest reasons you've been as successful as you, as you've been. Yeah, I appreciate that. It was, um, it was kind of interesting. I learned that a lot of people who graduated, so I graduated from full sale. Yeah. I learned that a lot of people that would graduate with my degree, you know, they were, they kind of felt entitled. You know, I graduated from full sale. I I don't need to be an intern or, they thought that the, the piece of paper validated their skill or them to walk into the music industry. When in reality, you know, this the music industry isn't full of people that have degrees. You don't need a degree to make music. And even, you know, when you're looking at your people like Steve Jobs, he does not have a college degree. So it really means nothing. And the path that I took, I, I take I took, I'm sorry, online classes. So I was still in Michigan when I started and I moved down to Atlanta. And because my classes were online, I was forced to begin working in the field, per se. And I think that's what really um, made me a lot more successful than my peers at the time, because it, because I had to uh, work right away. So I, I couldn't be on campus. And the students on campus, they, ca- they can't work the way I could because they're on campus. They have projects. They have to go meet with people. And their schedule is a lot more tighter. I was in situations where I, I might have only logged into my computer for school once a week, watched a video, did my assignment, and that was it. And I talked to students on the campus. And I think the most interesting thing that Full Sail does with their audio students is that they would make them uh, have a studio session at four in the morning. Because that's you know how the industry is. It's not a nine to five. You do have to clock in sometimes at one o'clock in the morning and stayed there until 12. Um, but I didn't have those experiences because I was online. But the beauty in that is that I had to begin to make my own connections and work in the industry and get the hands-on experience. But it allowed me to learn uh, classic, not classic. I, I can't think of the word. I, I was able to learn in school and then take it right away over into the music industry the same day. If I've seen a trick that my teacher taught me, I did that in my job. You know, if if somebody brought me a a song to mix, but I just learned this new cool EQ technique, I did that same EQ technique that technique that I just learned maybe five minutes ago, or whenever I watched the video. So for me, that was very very helpful, and I always recommend the online students that I talk to, like, go work right now. Don't wait until you get your degree to, you know, tell people that you're qualified to be an audio engineer for them because I was able to make more money telling people I'm a full sale student than I was a full sale graduate. No one cared that I graduated because I was in school. They took me more serious when I was telling them or suggesting them things to do. Um, but I, I think that was probably the the biggest thing to my success was I was in school and working at the same time. Yeah, that's some real ambition right there. <laughs> some real ambition right there. <laughs> Um, also I feel like, you know, if you're taking the skills that you're learning and then immediately applying them that next day, that kind of plays back into you, that early childhood, you're playing your, you're playing instruments just by ear. Like, you know, so many people, when they have something that they, they want to do, or they, they really love, they're like, you know, they don't know how to start. Like they know like, Oh, if I could just, if I could just get past this point or like whatever, but I, the, the key to so many of those things is you just gotta, you just gotta go like, and you're, you're in school and you're doing it. So that's, that's gotta have been huge for you. Yeah. It was a, honestly, it came from a, a weird sense of urgency. You know, I felt like I was very, very far behind. Um, Cause I, I recognized that I had a higher skill level but I wasn't in a 
higher skill level place. You know, I wasn't in I wasn't in those rooms yet, and I I wanted to be there so bad. On top of, um, I quit my job one time, so I had to. It kind of forced myself to like, hey, you gotta do it. You have to make this mm-hmm. work. So I had a very, I still have a very weird sense of urgency. I was just talking to my publicist about some things, and she goes, Joey, you have to calm down. This takes three months, even with my biggest of artists and clients, it takes them time to do this. You have got to relax because I'm, I'm trying to move fast, you know, because yeah, that sense of urgency. Time, yeah, it, it, it's very weird. And I had to apologize. Like, you know, Hey, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to disrespect or come across, but I'm very impatient. I try, I try to be more patient, but um, I like things to happen fast. So, and that's bad sometimes that, that has, definitely played against me many a time moving too fast but uh, I think in the beginning I had a very very weird sense of urgency that uh, if I'm being honest I'm glad that I don't have it now because I was in situations where I was spread too thin I was doing too much and it made me very unproductive and it looked like I was productive because I'm doing so many things but those things were never going to reach their, their full potential because I wasn't spending the proper time on them. I was doing everything possible. So I had to learn, you know, I'm still learning patience, but I also had to learn to not say yes to everything and not be so urgent to make something happen. And that's really where my sense of urgency came from is that I had nothing. and I just wanted something to happen. So I would take any project, whenever somebody said, hey, Joe, can you do this? Yes, because if it goes right, I have something that's happening. And that's all I wanted was something positive to happen. So I was very urgent and very weird. But I was also a lot younger. So I can see where that ambition was coming from looking back on it. But uh, it definitely bit me in the butt a couple of times. Well, I think it's better to have it be that way than the other way around. You know, try, it's always... It's always better to to tell someone to dial it dial it back a little bit or something like than it is to tell someone to to turn up like uh, I, the the biggest example I can think of is a uh, is a basketball example like you know people love to hate on Russell Westbrook in fact in my last podcast I said some negative things about Russell Westbrook but <laughs> the way the way that he goes out there and just goes goes for it all like he give gives everything every single every single game. There's not a single teammate that he's had that has been like, I don't want somebody like that in my corner. And then there's the people that are like, I don't know, Andrew Wiggins previous to his Golden State experience because he, he was he was better last year. But it was like he he was one of those guys who had all the talent in the world. Everybody thought he was going to be I don't, the, the next great thing. And he just never got any better. And he didn't didn't have that that drive to go in go and do do great things so i don't know i i know you said it's nipped you in the butt a co- or you know it's messed you up a couple times but it's that's that's a that's a really great thing to have yeah the it's, it's interesting that you were just talking about westbrook because he's one of my favorite players to watch i don't watch too too much i'm sorry too many sports anymore i don't even know too many sports is correct i'm sorry i know that dramatically it's okay stuff. I don't know. English major, so I'm always trying to make sure I talk <laughs> directly. But I don't watch sports too much anymore, but I love watching Russell Westbrook. And I was on Instagram, and I seen a. I love Kobe. Kobe was hands down my favorite athlete. He just talked. There's a quote of him talking about Westbrook and, and the energy that he has. And I don't think we have somebody that's as energetic as Westbrook, like just consistently through the years, and. I love that a lot about Westbrook. I love people who are like a blast and they last. Like you can't contain them. You know, they're just very high energy. They're gonna get it done. If they roll over you to do it, they roll over you to do it. It's the best for you to get out the way. But I think that people with high energy like that, they eventually get to where they're supposed to be going. So I really hope the best for Westbrook. I think that he's one of the players that is well deserving of a ring eventually, just because he's such a good player. You know. But mm-hmm. he's definitely very, very high. Uh, you know, hopefully, he can make something shake this next year. Yeah, he's one of those players that I don't think that we're gonna really appreciate everything that he's done until he's either a won a championship or b retired. And yeah. 
it's really sad that people, you know, say say all the things that they say about him because he's not perfect. But no, no, nobody, nobody's perfect. We we keep trying to hold these people to these impossible standards that they're never going to be able to live up to. It's it's just a little ridiculous. Um, right. Sorry, I I always I I don't want to talk too much about sports. I get I get too into talking about sports. Um, you've worked with some truly impressive names over the course of just your very limited time doing this like professionally i know you were doing it while you were in school but you graduated in 2019 it's 2021 and you've worked with some amazing names like maroon five hit boy you uh were the executive producer of the number one album in canada like that's that's just phenomenal um who is somebody that you are looking forward to working with in the future or that you would like to work with so that's a tough question. Yeah, so Honestly, you thought I was going to ask which one was your favorite. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So honestly, um, I can't say that there's somebody I'm looking forward to working with because for me, every a lot of a lot of music is very personal, you know, and I'm, I'm learning that the music we hear on the radio is not always the music that person creates you know a lot of times you put out an album with 13 songs that artist might have recorded a hundred just to get there and sometimes that those 13 songs out of the 100 songs aren't a true reflection of the artist it's a reflection of the time the record label what's popular other people's input so i i had to learn to not want to work with like not dream to work with people because it can become very limiting in my creativity, but it can also um, kind of change my perspective on that person. You know, so I used to really want to work with Drake. And I, and I always want to work with people. So it's not that I don't want to work with anybody, but I don't you know say like, oh, I, want, I can't wait to work with this person anymore because mm-hmm. I learned that if I'm supposed to work with them, that time will come. But when... I used to tell myself, oh, I can't wait till, till I work with Drake. Something happened. I don't know if I was thinking this or somebody told me this, but I had a, a brain switch where I learned that eventually those top artists that we dream of working with, they don't become top artists. And i much rather be on the ride with somebody to the top than to catch somebody at the top and I'm not able to sustain because I didn't build a foundation. So, you know, I would love to work with any top major artist, you know, but it, I'm not um, developing anybody right now, so I can't say that I'm looking forward to anybody's future. But I don't really have an artist that I can't wait to work with, more so because you find the time, um, the time finds you, honestly, for you and that artist to work together, whatever the, artist, the opportunity, or whatever the case may be. I think if it was, um, if there was one artist that I would like to, work with but not necessarily produce them or I would like I would like a Drake song. I would like Drake to write or I would like to be in the studio with Drake and say, hey, can you do some background vocals? Or um I don't listen to too much of Tyler Creator's music, but he's very creative. Mm-hmm. You know, Tyler the Creator, his his music is not stagnant. It, it moves very well. Um, so he he might be a person that I, I would say I can't wait to work with but I don't necessarily have ambitions to work with him, nor Drake. You know, if it happens, I'm happy. But if it doesn't, um, that's, that's life, you know. But I do want to get to the point where I'm accessible to everybody, where I have access to everybody and can work with them. Um, because I believe that ideas are should be the true foundation of creativity, not ambition and goals. So I, I want I want to have an idea where I say, hey, you know, I think Drake sounds good on this and he should sing a song with Taylor Swift because I have the idea that I could make it happen versus I really want to work with Drake. I really want to work with Taylor. And then I'm trying to just do all the wrong things to make any song happen versus the right song. But I used to want to work with a lot of people. Um, a, a lot of people. But I didn't know how to get to them. And mm-hmm. that was another part of it is that I had no idea how to get to them. You know, I love Beyonce. I had no idea how to get to Beyonce. I still don't know how to get to Beyonce. 
Yeah, she's like, if you find out, let me know. <laughs> me, so I've gotten the, the closest I've gotten to Beyonce was the producer and her cousin, and to me that was a kind of like an eye opener in terms of how close you can be to people, yet they're still very very far away. You know, um, I, I had the opportunity to work with John John Tracks. We were developing the same artist a couple of years ago, and my artist kept saying, yeah, you know, I'm going to take you over to Beyonce producer's house. And I'm like, why are you working with one of Beyonce's producers? Like, how did, how did you get there? Because, like, you know, he, he's a rapper. His name is Bando Pop, but I was very confused as to how he knew one of Beyonce's producers. And so I Googled John John, and he had produced my favorite Beyonce song, Deja Vu. And I remember when I first heard Deja Vu, I was in the fifth grade. And Beyonce's album was the first album I ever bought myself. And as a guy, I felt very weird, you know, buying a woman's album because if all my homeboys looked at my iPod, all you seen was Beyonce. And I wouldn't really know how to explain it aside from you got to listen to Deja Vu. And you understand why I spent my money on like, my little iTunes card on Beyonce. And I went over, went over to his house to work and it was a very uh, full circle moment for me. You know, to to watch him produce a song and to see that I picked up on his tricks just by listening to songs that he did. So to see that me and him had similarities in our producing, but had never met, had never talked, to me that was pretty full circle, and uh, I loved it. You know, just being able to work with somebody who, you know, I play his song on repeat for years. You know, if somebody asked me my favorite Beyonce song, Deja Vu. If you ask me my top five favorite songs, Deja Vu. So. That was pretty cool. And then uh, I had a manager at the time. He was good friends with one of her first cousins. And I walked into his apartment, and this, you know, her cousin is there. I'm looking at him. I'm like, you look familiar. Like, do I know you? She's like, no, you don't know me. I said, like, what do you do? Like, you know, because she, she just had this face that I had seen before. And she goes, oh, you know, I have a fam famous cousin. Our family's out in Houston. I got a rich uncle. But she didn't say any names. You know, I'm living in Atlanta. A lot of people lie in Atlanta. So when somebody says, oh, I have a famous cousin or, you know, I think it's just blowing smoke. And I don't want to ask who, because if I ask who, you tell me and I don't know. Either I feel stupid or you look stupid. And, you know, I didn't want that. I've had that so many times. Where, oh, who's your cousin? Or who is this? And I don't know. Him. So I feel stupid for not knowing somebody that everybody else in the room knows or this person's lying. So I was just, you know, OK, that's cool. Famous cousin, rich uncle. And her cousin had watched me work with a writer for about two days. And she goes, you should really work with my cousin. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, you know, it's, it's great. Whoever your cousin is, I'd love to work with him. I liked her. So I figured, you know, if I like you, I must like your cousin too. You know, I must be similar. Mm -hmm. She goes, and she could tell that I didn't know who her cousin was. And she goes, you don't know who I am, do you? I said, no, I asked you what you did. And you said you, you did nails and that you weren't anybody famous, but your cousin was. I don't know who your cousin is. So then she Googled herself, and it popped up, Beyonce's first cousin. I said, wow, you're Beyonce's cousin? She goes, yeah, you need to work with her. I said, can you make that happen? She said, no. I said, How am I supposed to get there? <laughs> but, oh you know, goodness. that was like, you know, the people can be right there, and they're still very mm -hmm. far away. But you also never know how close you are, uh, too. You know, mm -hmm. It could have been a simple conversation where maybe she could make it happen. You know, say Beyonce doesn't operate how Beyonce operates. Hey, cuz, you should work with this guy. And maybe it happens, you know? But that was, those are my closest Beyonce stories that I have so far in my career. Yeah, well, if you ever get, you know, in the same vicinity as Beyonce, make sure you let me know because I'll, I'll, I'll find a way, I'll find a way to slide. <laughs> I'm letting the entire world know. Actually, I, I take everything I said back about not wanting to work with the artist. Beyonce. Um, I think that she is Honestly, she's she might be my second biggest influencer aside from Michael Jackson in terms of my music. Um, and I'm kind of mad I didn't say that earlier. I will want to work okay. with Beyonce. She's, uh, when she listens to this, I'm sure she'll forgive you. <laughs> I really hope so. But it would definitely be Beyonce. I think that Beyonce is... Now, people get mad at me when I say this, but I'm a, and I'm a huge Michael Jackson fan. But Beyonce is a lot better than Michael Jackson. And Michael Jackson is the best. 
But I don't think that we're going to give Beyonce her flowers for, um, if I'm being honest, I don't think that people like a woman being that great and being that powerful and being that able and that clean. You know, Beyonce's career has no blemishes. When you ask somebody about her, they tell you how hard working she is. Um, when I watched the Homecoming documentary, that was the first time, and this is crazy, but the, the first time that I thought Beyonce was a woman, like a regular person, was that Homecoming documentary. She's recovering from having twins, and you can see that she's going through something very normal. And I was like, wow, Beyonce is she's a person. That's crazy. Because, you know, we always see the, the persona in the artist. And for me, it was a, it was cool to, to see her in that way, but to also see her dominate and get back to where she wanted to be at. You know, I don't think a lot of people could do what she's done. And her music is through the roof. She, she can uh, sing any type of song. Her voice is greatly trained. Um, one of her engineers said that they spend maybe an hour recording a song because they're never doing retakes. They're just doing more takes. But then they might spend six hours choosing which take is better and, and making a better comp. He said there's no auto tune on her voice. He doesn't have to pitch correct anything because her voice is just that trained. She can sing and dance at the same time. Um, the older she gets, the more creative she gets, which I think is very, very beautiful. A lot of times, the older artist gets, the, the more they lack creatively and the more the music is bad. But uh, it would definitely be Beyonce. She's a. Uh, Beyonce. That's the one artist that if I had to choose, like I would work with, it would be Beyonce. And then Michael Jackson was still alive. Michael Jackson and, and Prince. Um, Michael Jackson's music was very uh, universal, and that's something that I strive to do in my career is to have music or create a bunch of music to where anybody can listen to me. You know, um, everybody listen to Michael Jackson, and he's mm -hmm. passed. He's been passed away for quite some time now and even kids that they have kids that were born after he died they, you say michael jackson they know who you're talking about you know i think it, the time the time did a, uh, a poll and michael jackson was still the most famous person in, in the world i think it was like five years after his death or it was something very weird but i, I wouldn't have guessed that michael jackson was still like amongst the most famous people in the world even though he had passed away. But his music was very universal. I remember when he died, CNN had a clip of a guy from Germany who could not speak any English, had no idea you know, what, uh, what any word was in English. When he sang Man in the Mirror, you couldn't tell that he didn't speak English. He, he sounded like no accent at all, and he sounded you know, perfect. And I think that's the power of music, is being able to convince somebody to seeing something that they don't actually, they're not able to comprehend. So when mm -hmm. I seen that, you know, I was, and I wasn't making music at that time, when I seen that, I wanted that. You know, I wanted to be able to do something that everybody across the world could join in, and that it wasn't about black or white or man or woman or what kind of food you like or any preference like that. Like, if you like music, you like this, and, and you're able to listen to it and can appreciate it for what it is, you know. Um, and Prince was a great creator, very experimental. Um, and one thing that, as I, and I, I have to be honest, I never liked listening to Prince's music, but I love watching him perform. Like, I love his live music. But one thing I, I respected, respected a lot about Chris, Chris, I'm sorry, Prince, was that a lot of artists would say, oh, Prince wanted to work with me, but he only will work with me if I own my masters. And at first, I was like, you know, why is that a big deal? Until I got more and more into the industry and seeing the power of owning your own music. So Prince was very much a trailblazer in the independent artists, you know. There's an interview where Nas said that Prince was at a party and said, hey, I want to work with you. Do you own your masters? And he said, no. Well, call me when you own your masters. Nas never got all his deals, so he couldn't work with Prince. And uh, I think there's a lot of different small learning lessons in that but. But for, for the business reason and for how creative and experimental Prince was, it would definitely be Beyonce, Michael Jackson, and Prince for who I wish I could work with. Yeah, um, I I haven't I've never really gotten the opportunity to like 
get into prints, uh, which just sounds so so bad as the words come out of my mouth. You, but you, you need to taste, you know, because uh, I, I love music, but I can't sit and listen to a Prince album. There's something I don't know if it's because I wasn't born in the '80s or I, I was I didn't grow up then, but to me, there's something missing. But when he performs live. To me, that's that's some of the best music that you'll ever see mm-hmm. and hear. But um, the one thing I always respected about Prince is that I think he, he was one of the first artists to play every instrument on his own album. And that's honestly a goal that's crazy. that I want to have for myself you know, when I get to the point of making albums is that I, I want to be able to sit and play every instrument because Prince did that. And I thought that that was something that a lot of people couldn't do. I think the last person to do it, uh, his name was Beck. He won a Grammy over, he actually won a Grammy over Beyonce. And people couldn't figure out why he had one album of the year until it came out that he, I think his was 27 instruments. He played all the instruments, he wrote all the songs, recorded himself, and mixed, like he did everything himself. But the reason why the Grammys had gave him album of the year is because no other artist is one playing an instrument, yet alone 27 different ones. But yeah, that's, that's that crazy. Yeah, that's, that's ridiculous. And I'm mm-hmm. sure that I'm sure that he wasn't doing it how I plan on doing it myself and just messing around and making it happen. I'm sure he could read music, you know. So that's a very, very high skill level to be able to play 27 different instruments, record yourself, make an album. And, you know, I'm glad that somebody like him was recognized for it. And I wish that people um, paid more attention to why he won that album of the year. Because I, I never listened to the album. I honestly didn't know who Beck was until then. Mm-hmm. And honestly, that, that might not even be his name. I might be talking about the wrong person, but I'm almost sure his name is Beck. And uh, to, to do that is, is astonishing. Astonishing. A lot of people can't play one instrument in the music industry. Let alone yeah. That was uh, definitely a goal that I set for myself because I seen that somebody else could do it. Yeah, that's something that when I was, when I was younger, I never really appreciated like the skill of being able to, I don't know, do multiple things. Like when, especially writing music, like I, you know, we were talking about Drake earlier. I, I'm a huge Drake fan and he's, he's battled the rumors of him not writing his own stuff for as long as I can remember. Um, and that had never, that it had never meant anything to me because I just loved his music. You know, I yeah. granted, I, I think he, I think he writes his own stuff. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna say anything like that, but being able to perform, especially your own instruments on an album, when people dedicate their entire lives to being able to play an instrument, just have any output creatively, the ability to, perform 27 different (laughs) instruments on an album is just completely baffling i i could i couldn't even i don't think i could name 15 instruments right now if i had someone put a gun to my head i was just thinking like what 27 instruments did he play like what was he doing but i'm i'm sure that he had a lot of fun doing it making making a lot of different Mm -hmm. noises I can imagine that's what it was, was just fun. Even when Prince is 13, I still want to know what 13 instruments did Prince use. Like, yeah. What, what were you playing? I'm sure, yeah. The, the amount of genius that that has to take is just something that I don't think is... Like, we, we appreciate the, the great artists when they come through, but, like, that's something that should be, like like passed down like everybody knows like this person yeah. had a uh, incredible voice and you hear this the saxophone this piano whatever they they were doing it all themselves like like it it always reminds me I, I, of the oh go ahead you go ahead i'm sorry oh okay uh, i was saying it always reminds me of uh the movie soul that came out a couple years ago um just uh when when dude is just playing the piano and it's like his like your brain just shuts off like and you're just moving on instinct and it's like something that like if somebody's observing it from the outside it's like wow like this is yeah. something that somebody had to have committed like 
hours and hours and hours of their life to, and they just are able to do this with like, and if you, you were to say something to them while they were doing it there, they would have no idea what you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) I think that, uh, I I think we used to be in a time where we appreciated. I don't, I don't think we ever appreciated artists playing the instruments, but I think that we used to be at a time where we appreciated musicians who could play instruments. You know, you look at somebody like James Brown, where he he brought in Boosie Collins, or you know, he started off Maceo, and then Maceo begins to play for Prince, and then you know, Maceo is uh, is a saxophone player. So anytime you hear like or any similar saxophone song in hip hop, that's Maceo. That's a Maceo sample, and you know, at the time. People were really appreciative of those different musicians playing with these artists. You know, even when you um, talking about somebody like Dizzy Gillespie, I might have said his name wrong. Um, you know, but we we used to be in times where we cared about musicians. You know, people would go to a bar to see a trumpet player, um, mm-hmm. and I think that we'll get back to that eventually. I'm not really sure when. I think it'd take a huge, huge culture shift, especially um, in the U.S. So right now I'm in Brazil. Here in Brazil, mm-hmm. they love music. Any kind of way you can give it to them, they appreciate musicians like I've never seen it before. But I hope that in the U.S. we, we get back to caring about the musicians. You know, even thinking about drummers like Travis Baker or uh, what, what's the guy? Slash, the, the guitar mm-hmm. player. Um, I think that we need to get back to a time where we are, we are appreciating the person who created the sound, and not just the person who's singing the song. Yeah, I think it's it's harder and harder for people to go see things like that and appreciate it just because here we have so many different things that are always grabbing our attention, like mm-hmm. left and right. Like it's hard. It's harder at least than it's ever been like we have so many different things that we could do now there's less of the chance that on like a random thursday night we go somewhere to sit down and listen to somebody playing some like some listening to live music somewhere i was just talking to uh um this gentleman i work with and uh he used to manage a couple of rock bands in the 70s and he talks about how there's nobody or there's no places not very many places anymore that you can just go and sit and listen to like hours and hours of live music anymore. And I, it's something that I I never would have thought that we're, we're missing out on, but I'm just like, damn, I've never, the only live concert I've ever been to, this is, this is really embarrassing. Riff Raff visited Tallahassee a couple of years ago. Yeah. (laughs) And my friends got a, I think it was like $5 for tickets and it was all you can drink there. So it was just, it was just a great well, I'm time. Sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure you had a good time. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a great time, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, back to some of the, the people that you have like worked with previously, what would you say is, what would you say is your proudest accomplishment? I know being an ambitious person, you're always thinking of the next thing that you're going to be doing. And I know you've got a lot of awesome stuff coming up, but what would you say you're most proud of right now? Um, I think actually what I'm most proud of right now is what's going on right now. And I don't know how the, I know how that sounds, but honestly, that's just the truth. Yeah, um, let's talk about that then. A lot of the past work that I did, it, it would never see the light of day um, for multiple reasons. Every song has a different reason why it won't get released. So when I worked with Maroon 5, the the song was Girls Like You. And they were doing remixes for the song, but the album didn't do well. So they, they couldn't follow their normal album protocol for a pop uh, for a pop album where you do the album and then you send the song out to different producers for remixes. And now you have a club remix, a dance remix, a reggae remix. So you just have different versions of the song to fit different areas of, of the world per se so i worked on a remix and then the album tanked and this was in 2018 i believe so this is right before hip-hop like really takes over for 
the number one genre. So Lil Uzi is like he just became Lil Uzi. And because of that, they didn't use any of the remixes. They ended up uh, replacing the original version of the song with the version that we have now that has Cardi on it. And because of that, you know, my version never comes out because they had to redo the formula of their entire album. And they started adding more rappers and more hip hop flair to it. Luckily, we were in a digital space, so they could swap out songs on, on iTunes fast and no one noticed it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when I work with Hit Boy, and they, the artist's name is um, Chill, Chilly Chill. He was part of this uh, surf club out in LA. And he was very close with Hit Boy. He gave me the opportunity to mix a song with Hit Boy producing it and Stacey Mark and did the background vocals. So I'm all excited. You know, I got Hit Boy song. I love Hit Boy. And Nipsey Hussle had a, a, another song over that same beat. Somebody leaked it. So when the song got leaked, the beat had to get bought, which meant that my artist who got the beat for free because Hit Boy was like his brother, his song didn't matter anymore. So I ran into a lot of situations where the work that I did for the artist just never sees the light of day. And honestly, that's just the nature of the game. You know, one thing I learned is that you could do your job a thousand percent correct and it's really dependent on somebody else. So, you know, what I have going on right now is honestly, I learned how to take control. I got very tired of putting my fate in other people's hands because at the end of the day, you know, the music industry and life is it's about self-preservation. You got to take care of yourself. And people aren't going to take care of you. You know, sometimes I might have had the better song, but I didn't have the better relationship. Sometimes I had the I had a bad relationship and a bad song. You know, there's a lot of reasons why you know, things might not go your way. So um, I came down to Brazil last year to kind of weird actually so these old dudes hit me up on facebook hey do you want to put an american rap on brazilian samba i'm like first off i don't rap i sing but we'll go with it because when i sing i rhyme a little bit with a different type of cadence sometimes i said was a brazilian samba whatever you know my, my mentor always told me you're never too big until you're too big even when you're too big you're never too big and there's one of those phrases where it's like, well, you just repeat yourself. And I asked him what that meant because I got tired of hearing it without being able to comprehend it as a kid. And he said, bro, you're never too big until you're too big. And if you're too big, that means that you're just too busy. You're not too big of a person. So you're never really too big for somebody. You're just too busy, even when it seems like you're too big. So in my mind, I'm looking at these guys on Facebook and they look like, you know, they're just you know 50 years old or so. I'm like, I'm not going to work as a 50-year-old person. I'm 20 years old and or 21. But that the moment I thought that, that quote popped in my head, you're never too big. I said, hey, yeah, sure, send the song over. They send the song over, and the production was, the quality of the production was like that, something I'd never heard before, and it wasn't what I was expecting. So I, I hopped on the song, um, and then we shot a video for it in June. And th- then that next fall, they called, hey, Joe, we're going back to Brazil to perform for a festival. We would really like you to come perform with us because here in Brazil, they love um, they love English music, but they love English music with their music. So you hear a couple of their songs on the radio that have like five English words in it because English mm-hmm. isn't even a fifth language here. So I came down here and the artist told me I could stay with him in his city. And then when you know we're about a week away from booking on my flight. He goes, oh, you can't stay with me. I'm having surgery. But the, the producer of the song lives in Rio. He might be able to take you there. So I go to Rio and I, I stay in an Airbnb. I meet the producer. And for about a week and a half, I'm by myself. My, the rest of my team hadn't gotten there yet. And because really, the artist wanted me to come for three days. And I was like, I'm not coming to Brazil for three days. I've never been there. I'm going to go there for two weeks. Like That sounds... Like it makes a lot more sense and more fun, you know. You gotta be in See, I thought you were. Days. I thought you were gonna go the other way around. <laughs> you said three weeks or two weeks. <laughs> so, um, I, I get here and I fell in love. The people here are so warm and so nice, and the mu- There's music everywhere. 
So I would, I would be hearing drums. And you could just walk to where you thought the drums were coming from, and you're seeing a marching band, or you're seeing them practice for carnival, or you're hearing a rock band or a samba band, or you're walking and now you, you see these people doing dance classes. And there's just music and movement everywhere throughout the entire country, honestly. So I fell in love with it. And then um, my mentor, we wanted to use, at the time, uh, everybody had a TV show idea. You know, I had an agent that had 20 ideas. My mentor had an idea. Um, the guy that connected me with my agent had an idea. So I called my agent. I said, hey, because at the time, the streaming platforms were taking the uh, shows were being taken off, off the streaming platform so that the owner could start their own. So, like, we, we were in situations where ABC was taking down ABC shows from Netflix so they could put them on ABC's platform. So all these platforms were looking for original content because it's not just about Netflix or Hulu anymore. So mm -hmm. he, my agent had five ideas. I said, hey, you know, if me and my mentor write together something, would you mind putting our deck amongst your pitches? He goes, yeah, just, just let me know. So we come up with this TV show idea where we travel across the world and we work with um, a big artist from that country. We show the culture of the country, the people, the attractions, and then we show the artists. Unfortunately, last year in February, when we did it, of course, because we didn't know anything. I make music. I don't know. I had no idea why I was even thinking about a TV show, but, you know, ideas are ideas. And we didn't know what we were doing. Um, we knew what we wanted to do. But we didn't know the means that we needed to do it by. So we, everybody got down here and we shot it horribly. We sent the footage back to uh, the agent. He was like, this, is, this looks good, but I don't know that this is a show. I, I don't know anything right now. And you know, it, it kind of gave us a major setback because we were in a position where had we did it correctly, because these platforms were so desperate, we would have went right to Disney without even having to do too much work because they just needed things. And because we messed up so bad and then the pandemic hit, it's not until I came down here in April to begin to plan and you know start my career as an artist here, but also prep for the TV show. But it's not until next February where we're going to actually shoot the episode. And the reason why, <clears throat> to go back, go back to your question, why I'm most excited um, about this time more than anything else where I think this is my greatest accomplishment is because I actually control this. So <clears throat> through the TV show, I'm able to actually control my first major release. So we, That's cool. we, work, with the, you know, we, we work with the artists and we produce three songs with them and then our company puts the songs out. And this is the very first time that I know for a fact I'm working with a major artist and the song is going to be without a question. And that's honestly uh, something that I'm very, very excited about because I've been doing this for six years, three years, you know, full time. And I've been in a lot of situations where I think something's going to happen. And it's just one thing that's off. And honestly, because my job is so simple in music, just making the music, it was almost never my fault that it didn't happen. It was always something on the business end. And it's not that it's even somebody's fault. It's just business. It does or it doesn't happen for whatever reason. And I was getting very tired of that. It could be discouraging to be very close and still not have it, you know. So with this situation, I know for a fact that I'm working with a major artist. I actually just got done producing one of the songs a couple of days ago, which made me more excited. Like, I, I can hear the song now, and I know it's going to come out. You know, I'm very excited, you know, just mm -hmm. for like, the music part. And I haven't even... It hasn't really hit me that, you know, we're going to shoot a show and, and hopefully we put it on Netflix or Discovery Channel or whoever decides to pick it up. But I'm excited that, you know, I I'm, I get a, my first major release, you know, and to actually work with somebody who's signed to a major record label without it being knocked away. You know, this is surefire. The contracts came back in. We have to do it. So mm -hmm. I, I'm very excited about this phase right here. Um, on top of, you know, I believe that you have to be excited for the now. Um, I think everything in the past is a learning lesson. I know that I'll look back on this and, you know, uh, I'll probably feel a lot more emotional about this because this will be my first major release. But one thing I learned is that, especially in music, you can't really look back. Even though your past 
will always get you to your future. I can't, I, I'd be lying if I said, you know, hey, I don't use my past to as leverage to help me do something. I tell people left and right, oh yeah, I worked in Maroon 5. I did this with Hit Boy. Even though those songs never come out, just somebody hearing that, sometimes it makes them want to work with me. And sometimes those songs are four years old, you know? So I, I definitely lean on my path a lot to help me move forward, but I try not to um, think about it too much or to uh, miss a moment, you know, because mm -hmm. you have to be in the now. You know, I don't want to sit back and, oh, man, I, I miss when I was working on these songs because I, I can't go back to the past. You know, I have to focus on right now, but uh, I'm definitely excited for what I'm working on right now because this would be the first time that I have a major release coming out without a problem because I'm being honest, I don't have any major releases. And you know, a lot of times that's been my problem is that, you know, I work with these names, I have great music, I had a lot of independent clients that I worked with and artists, but I didn't have any major releases. So, you know, if you, you see my bio, if you, if you read my bio, you would think I might have songs that I have none that are major. So this is going to be, um, very, very crucial to my career. And so I'm very excited to uh, just make it happen. You know, um, this is what I've been looking forward to, if I'm going to be out of my first yeah. major years. But, you know, if there was a lesson to it, it's to control it yourself. You know, don't put your faith in other people's hands. You know, this was something that me and my mentor controlled, and that's why it's able to happen. And it came by way of a TV show, but it was something that we had control over. And only person that can mess this up is me or him. And I'm not going to do it. I know, know that he won't do it. So it's very surefire, you know. So I, I'm very, very excited. I think that that's, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that you answered that like that because I think it really speaks to just the top level of people like in, in your profession because I don't know, like so many people would be like, something I'm most proud of is that I worked with Maroon 5 or that I worked with Hit Boy. And you're like, I've got my TV show that I'm working on every day that that's what I'm most proud of. I, I moved to Brazil. I'm, I'm building this like brick by brick, day by day. Um, but just, yeah. just so I have like a firm grasp of the show. So you guys pick artists from different areas. You produce three songs with them and then you release the three songs. Right. And that's, that's the, that sounds awesome. That sounds awesome. It, 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 it's um, it's going to be very fun. You know, one thing that I learned about myself, because before I came to Brazil, I had never left the country. So I had no, no, uh, no viewpoint on how I thought about different cultures, aside from you know, my friends of a different culture. But I'd never been outside the country. And I loved it. I, I walked around. I, I'm, still, I'm still learning Portuguese, but... Last year, I really didn't know Portuguese. It sounded like Spanish, but with like a French Italian accent. It was weird to me. I was walking around just getting lost every day, you know, just trying to soak up culture, learn new things, learn meet new people, and I, I loved it. Um, so I'm very excited to go. The other countries we have on the sh on the show right now are Japan, Azerbaijan, and Ethiopia. So I'm very excited to, you know, of course, make music with these artists, but I'm excited to learn different cultures, you know. Um, I've learned a lot just by being in Brazil, you know, not about, I learned a lot about Brazil, but I learned a lot about humans and, and human interaction and, and how things should be, you know, what's the difference between Brazilians and Americans and who does it better and why, what's, what's more natural and what's more systematic, you know, and it's, it's taught me a lot um, and it's changed my perception on a lot of things. My favorite thing about Brazil's music industry that I wish, and I think America is getting to it, um, hopefully. But my favorite thing about Brazil's music industry is that two of their top 10 artists are in the LGBTQ plus community. And that's not something that we have in America. We, we don't have that kind of representation. So you know, to see that their songs are on the radio, you know, uh, their personas are out there. One of them, uh, he identifies as a male, his name is Pablo Victor. And another one um, identified as a woman, Gloria Groove. I want to say that Gloria, she's a transsexual. I remember reading that you know, she had made a, um, a gender transition. And Pablo is identified as a drag queen. And because of the uh, 
gay culture here in Brazil is very open. And these artists make some of the best music I have ever heard in my life. And I have a, a gay artist I work with. His name is H.B. King. He's a social media influencer. He actually just won uh, a competition show called The Next Influencer on Awesomeness TV. And one of the things that we I always talk to him about, um, when I first met him, I remember, because uh, he's a he, very influenced by Megan Thee Stallion. And Megan Thee Stallion is actually a reason why he was able to go viral a lot of times. And his first writing session, he was afraid. He, he didn't know what to write because he's he identified as a male. But when he writes, you know, he writes hot girl things. So he was like, you know, can I say this? And I'm like, well, why can't you? I'm not thinking about anything, you know, this is my first time even meeting him. So I don't know why you can't say what you want to say. I always tell people, do what you want to do. Like, who cares? He says, I'm a, I'm a guy. And this is for girls. I said, who, who cares? Like, I was very confused at it. And then he said, no, like, this could come across the wrong way. And I said, bro, listen, if you feel this way, somebody else feels this way, too. So don't think about how everybody else is going to react. Just think about who also feels the same way. But the more and more, you know, I began to work with him, and, and Ace taught me a lot. So the way I used to write my songs, you know, I'm a straight male. So if I write a love song, it's going to be to a woman. And when I seen that, so Ace's biggest thing was he didn't know if he could say hot girl in his songs because he identified as a male. And I thought that that was very, it was, I took it two ways. It was, I thought it was very great that Megan could influence somebody like that to where he didn't mind saying what he wanted to say. But I also thought that it was very hindering in his creative process because he was still stuck on the gender, the gender identification part in the song. So I remember thinking, because he was like, he was very, very uh, concerned, confused, because he, he didn't want his music to come across the wrong way, not confident in it yet because these are his first songs. And I remember thinking, I don't, I never want a, uh, another artist to be inspired by me, but also um, hold themselves back or think that they have to. Because what if, you know, me and Ace's manager aren't there to say, hey, you can say this, like, be yourself, do whatever you want to do. He might not ever make the music he's going to make. So I remember thinking, like, you know, how can I, you know, alleviate somebody who is um, different from me? wants to be like me how, how can i alleviate this especially from a sexuality part because i would always say oh girl this or you know i'm referencing a girl with whatever i say so i took it out that way anybody who does anything they can agree with the song you know and i think the the best example i have is just because i'm singing to a girl doesn't mean that a guy singing can't sing this to a guy I, you know i make love songs what if like, two gay people are having sex and they hear the word girl in there? They don't even like girls. That might turn them off. And, and now their moment is ruined. I don't want to ruin anybody's moment because of how I am personally. You know, I want my music to be able to preach to everybody. So I learned that by taking out those genders, I was able to reach more people and have a more universal sound when it came to, um, uh, what's the word? Relatability. I don't even know if that's the word. Be more relatable. So um, Ace taught me that. And when I came down to Brazil and seeing that they actually had artists that were very big without judgment, like I've never seen a negative comment about either one of these artists. I remember calling Ace. And I said, hey, bro, I think you can do this. Like, I think that because we don't have anybody like an Ace in America, you know, um, I think Lil Nas X is an openly gay artist, but he's not feminine, you know, and he's not doing you know, the, the feminine things. And I, I called Ace and I said, hey, bro, if they can do this in Brazil to where two of their top 10 artists are like this and they're in the LGBTQ plus community and they're still feminine and they're, they're themselves, we can do that with you in America without question. On top of no one's done it yet. So somebody has to do it. So, you know, I think that's my favorite thing about Brazil is seeing how open they are with um, everything, including sexuality in their music, because. I think that that's something that in America we're very you know, closed-minded and we try to keep a, a, a cap on it, but it gets in the way of good music. You know, these it artists, does. those two artists are actually my fifth and sixth choice artists to go to for the TV show, but 
I ended up having to go with. Um, actually, I didn't even know that this artist was an option that we were using. Uh, I met her through a producer, and it, it ended up working a lot, a lot better with her than any other artist. And my favorite thing about Brazil's music industry is how open they are to um, sexuality because we're coming to a time where you don't know what anybody likes, you know, and who cares. So you mm-hmm. need representation across all boards. You know, the same way I feel about, you know, I love seeing more black people do things. You need more representation. Everybody needs representation in their own way. So, and there's room for all of it. There's room for black people, white people, straight people, gay people, people that don't like to eat pickles, people that don't like to, you know, brush your teeth in the morning or whatever kind of person you are. There's somebody else out there just like you and you can be represented in any field, you know, so. I love that part about Brazil a lot because no, no, I honestly don't think that anybody should be denied anything because of who they love or who they choose to have sex with. To me, that's so goofy. You know, it is. I always tell people, I, I understand, uh, I don't want to say, I want to say I understand, but I understand racism. You know, I understand sexism. Looking at somebody and say, oh, you're different on the outside. I don't want to be around you. That kind of makes sense. But when it came down to sexuality, when you say, hey, I, I'm like this on the inside, and you're rejected, that one uh, doesn't make sense to me. I remember um, a girl I was dating at the time, she uh, she was watching the show called Pose. So, of course, I had to watch it with her. And that show opened up my eyes so much to the things that people go through. It's something I never thought about. Being a black male, I always think about the black fight, you know. And... Honestly, I, I didn't know that you know, people get rejected by their families. Even when Ace was on the TV show and there were two straight men on there and he talked about how much he appreciated how welcoming they were because he didn't know how they would, would react because, you know, because of what he's gone through, he never knows what straight men will think of him or how they react to him because of how he is. And he was talking about how appreciative of them that he was. And he started to talk about his story. And so on the on the YouTube episode, there's a thumbnail of Ace crying. So I'm like, hey, why is nephew crying? Like, I want to see. I'm thinking of something funny because Ace is a comedian. So I'm like, why is he crying? So I go to watch the episode. And the moment he starts crying and talking about, you know, the rejection that he dealt with and all these things that really just came from him saying that he, he is who he is and that he loves this type of way and was rejected by you know, his family and, and friends and had to kind of start all over, that made me cry because I, I couldn't imagine like telling my mom, like, hey, you know, on the inside, I feel purple. And then I get kicked out the house because I feel purple on the inside. Like, that's crazy to me. And to see that people go through that was uh, really eye-opening to you know, the perception I, I had on things. Um, but, you know, Going back to Brazil, you know, I love that a lot about Brazil, and how open they are, not only with sexuality, but with people. They open me with warm arms or warm heart and open arms. Um, they, they don't really care too much about anything. But uh, just to see more openness and more, if I'm going to be honest, more carefree. You know, I'm a person, yeah. if my friends call me, hey, Joe, should I do it? You call me because you know that I'm going to tell you to do it. Whatever it is, do it. Go have fun. Be free. Like if you feel that you should do it, go do it, and deal with the consequences later. But at least you know that you're dealing with consequences of being yourself, not the consequences of you trying to, you know, fit into society. But you know, I, I love how open and, and welcome Brazil is. I'm hoping that America can get to a point of that with sexuality, but also with other things, cultures. You know, I, I mm-hmm. think that America is very. I don't, I don't mean to talk politics. But people have a perception that America is really the land of the free and that we're open and we, we welcome and you know, yada, yada, yada. I've seen so many different people get rejected because they're different religion, different ethnicity, different color, different, come from a different country, speak a different language, you know. So the openness in Brazil has really opened my eyes to see what I, what I want the rest of the world to, to be like, especially the country that I'm from, just to accept people for who they are and let them be them. Like at the end of the day, who cares? Like, why do I care what anybody does about anything? Like, what? I shouldn't care about your religion. I should care about my religion, but I shouldn't care about yours. I should be educated on yours so I, so I can be relatable and 
informative and you know have a conversation because differences are what bring us together but why should i care what you choose to do i should really be focused on myself and that's another thing i wish people you know would, would grasp is that it's none of our business what anybody does it's our business what we do you know it's my business what i do is your business what you do but who cares that we do different things we should actually have a conversation because we're different like you would think that people would get tired of talking to people that they're just alike but the, so I'm going on a rant. No, 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 no. I, 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 I'm agreeing with everything you're saying. Um, it, it really speaks to like this sense of tribalism. Humans, especially Americans, but just humans in general, of like always had. We're moving away from it, but we always want to, or we have always wanted to talk to people just like us, act just like us, stuff like that. Um, but you, you mentioning Lil Nas X reminded me of how. Just how he, how he's been, how people have changed their view of the, per, how the perception of him has changed since he's came out as gay. Like, um, like Lil Boozy has never met this man and has just, I don't know, said some of the most ridiculous things about him. And I, it just, I don't think that people would say things like that. Like if we were if if he lives somewhere else like that like you said brazil is so much more open and lil nas x is the first artist of his kind to do the stuff that he's doing the way that he's doing it um i'm i'm sure i'm wrong when i'm saying he's like the first like mainstream openly gay like rapper no, he, you no, know, artist you're, you're, like that you're, you're spot on. You're, you've had we have gay artists in the music industry, but no yeah. one has been like that openly out of the closet and uh, be as big as he is. He is hands down the first of his kind and his stature. Yeah. Um, and it's I a, a large part of I'm glad that he's doing it his way, because um, at first I thought part of part of the. Like when the video of him, like the music, I don't remember which song it was, but the one where he uh, is giving Satan a lap dance. Um, when I first, when, yeah, when I when I first saw that, I was like, man, that, like that that feels like it's like a little much. But then I'm seeing how people like react to him in general, not like not his music. Like if if somebody were to if somebody asked somebody else how they felt about his music and they're like, Oh, I don't really like his music, but I like like what he's doing for his community. Like and the people that are people that are gay, just like him, like that feel that same way. That would be one thing, but like people are just going out of their way to like attack his character. And the, the biggest, the biggest, the w- what's coming to mind right now is I'm not sure if you're aware about a uh, Tony Hawk. He was like a, skateboard skate like skateboarding legend he just started selling boards like infused with his blood in it which is weird i, I think I, I did, it's weird I've seen something like that but i seen it like alongside with um lil nas x selling the shoe so i wasn't sure yeah what people yeah, were so, yeah like somebody went, went on a rant about you know these demonic things or lil nas x blood in the shoe tony hawk blood in the skateboard and Kanye west had just I guess on his last performance, he had a church surrounded by fire. But I've seen it. Kanye, like, Kanye like is a that. whole different animal. I don't even know what Kanye <laughs> still is. <laughs> just if you, I mean, if you were, if an al- like, if an alien were to just come and sit in one of his like listening parties and just just watch just him and the way that he's getting people to just sit there and listen, the way that he's got all all his stuff going on, and they they would be, I don't know. I don't know. There, there's weirder stuff that goes on, but Kanye's yeah. Kanye's up <laughs> Kanye's up there. But you know, the one thing that I've learned is that the truer the creator, the weirder they are. You know, and Kanye is a true creator. You know, when I develop artists, I categorize them into four different ways: a creator, an entertainer, a creator who can entertain, an entertainer who can create. The creators are, you know, somebody like a prince or you know, somebody who is just very creative. Their music is the power of the creator is actually a better example because his music isn't always on the radio, 
but it's always good and it's always different. It's always changing. And you have an entertainer who is, um, you know, like Cardi B. Cardi B is in. Now, I love Cardi, so I don't want to. I don't want to say this and it sound offensive, but Cardi isn't a musician. So she, she she's an entertainer. You know, I remember mm -hmm. I, I would be in meetings and I said, "Hey, we need another hit for Cardi. We need this, and we're not going to put the album out till we have these types of songs." And I couldn't understand why somebody who's as big as Cardi B, you know, won't release the album until she has these types of hit songs, and Somebody said she she has to have them. She can't just put anything out. And I'm thinking, how come somebody as big as Cardi? Because in my mind, as an artist, you put out whatever you want to. So I'm mm -hmm. like, how come somebody as big as Cardi can't put out whatever music that she wants to? And when I thought about it, it was because she's an entertainer. She's not a creator, you know. And it's because of, it's because of how she's branded and who she is. There's a lot of things that go into this, but because she entertains, it has to be spot on. You know, it has to be entertaining when she does it. She can't just create something and hope that it goes. And then, you know, for your creators who entertain, that's when you get your superstars, your Beyonce, Michael Jackson, like people who changed the Sonic and also entertained while they did it. And then you have, you know, your entertainers who create, like J-Lo. J-Lo's an entertainer. She acts, she gets a judge, but she also creates music, you know. And they all have their give and takes, you know, as to how they have to operate, but um, I learned that the the more creative the person, the more weirder they are. They're different. You know, I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you. You have to be able to be like weird to create. You know, and Kanye is honestly the the pinnacle of a creator who entertains, but more so just a creator. Because Kanye had a song that said "Poopity Scoop" and it went like, number two on number one on iTunes. I thought that was the goofiest thing ever, but because Kanye West is a person that we look to, you know, due to what he has built up, we, we look to Kanye to change the the sonic. You know, like the reason why I believe in the when Drake dissed Kanye in the Triple Red song, he says, "Yeah, Ye, ain't changing shit." That's because we're always looking for Kanye to change the scope of music. If Kanye does this years later, everybody else begins to do it, and I think that. Um, being able to change sonics and, and being looked at as a creator, you have to be weird because you have to be doing something that everybody else isn't doing. So you can't be normal. You know, you have to be very out there. Um, and Kanye West is a very out there person. You know, Kanye West is actually a very uh, interesting person to study. I remember when people were calling him crazy because people didn't believe that he was actually bipolar because it wasn't something that they seen uh, that he was maybe years prior to, and they're thinking, oh, if he's bipolar, and he's really bipolar, how come he wasn't acting like this 10 years ago? And I learned, because I work with a lot of engineers in the, in the music industry on their mental health. Recording engineers, specifically out of the engineers, get treated the worst. And they have a very specific personality type. You know, they're that, they're, they're introverts. They're the, they're the person that, they don't care to be famous. But they're, and they're working on big songs. So it's kind of weird to work on a very big song and not care to be famous and not want to go out and party. You, you like being in the studio. You're a very you know, specific kind of person. And these people get treated really bad. And their mental health is um, can, can always be something that's a downfall or, or that that's not healthy because of the, the industry, how they get treated, their personality type, what they've gone through before they were even working. And... I remember I was just collecting data, and this is when I learned that a lot of you know, recording engineers and engineers in general were, we had the ability to become very depressive very fast. And a lot of us had dealt with depression before we even got into music, and then the music just made us worse. You know, you get getting paid, you might get paid $500 to work on a song, but that song just generated $5 million. So as where the artist is making money in their sleep, you have to stay awake to make some more money. It's a lot of stretches that go on. And I remember I said, okay, yeah, I collected my data on everybody else. Let me collect my data on myself. Because at the time, I was I, I was all over the place in my head. And I couldn't figure out why. And I was uh, going through periods of time when my anxiety was spiking, but I seemed to have no trigger. 
So I remember I logged uh, like my feelings for the day and why. And I remember I, I would get I was on the phone a lot at this time. So I would get a personal call. Hey, Joe, your car's about to get repoed. And then I would get a business call. Hey, Joe, you know, this person wants to spend some money with you. I just got a call that was about my car being taken away. And then somebody wanted to work with me within five minutes of each other. And then I got somebody who comes and they, they work with me. And they, oh, Joe, I love your music. You make great beats. And then five minutes later, hey, Joe, your dog died. How am I supposed to feel right now? And this is all happening within a day. And not all those things didn't happen in the day, but those mm-hmm. things were, you know, drastic like that to where your career, you get a high, your personal, you get a low. Then your personal gets high and then your career gets low. And I tracked my behavior. I said, wow, this is like a roller coaster. And no wonder my body is, you know, going like this because I, I'm training my body to feel this way by continuously feeling this way. I believe a, a lot of behaviors I learned. And I thought about somebody like Kanye, who is well, well, well above me. God knows what Kanye goes through, like what kind of phone calls that he gets and the good or bad news. I'm sure that Kanye's good news is really, really good and his bad news is really, really bad. So if you're receiving both high and low at the same time and your body is constantly reacting, eventually when you get to a, a point of just a, you plateau and nothing good or bad happens, your body is going to still be reacting. It's going to be going up and down because maybe for years you've been taking it up and down and you weren't noticing, you know, how you were allowing your body to feel. So when, when I seen that in myself and then in the other engineers, the first thing I thought was I can see how Kanye has developed this, and that he might actually really be bipolar because the music industry takes you through so many different emotions that if you're in it long enough and, you know, if you're not taking care of yourself, it'll happen. Your body will just naturally begin to do what you've already trained it to do. I remember... Last year when I came to Brazil, I think I might have walked around like five miles a day just getting lost. And there was one day that I didn't walk around because I had to do some homework. And my body was, I was just itching. I couldn't figure out why I just wanted to move around. But I had been walking like five miles a day for eight days. My body was used to moving. So I had to go move. And and it's it's the same thing with anything else. If you can get your body used to it because you're constantly doing it, your body's going to want to do it even when nothing is going on, or even when you shouldn't be doing it. So, you know, to go back to Kanye, you know, uh, yeah, great creator, very weird, um, but he's a, a very interesting person to, to study when it comes to all types of things, you know, but um, especially when it comes to being creative and mental health. I, I think he's a great case study on, on, you know, the do's and the don'ts, you know, and how somebody should maybe probably take care of themselves, not necessarily take care of themselves mentally, but um, for preventative work, how maybe you should handle your career so that you don't feel this way. You know, Kanye West is a one of one person, so he had to sacrifice and do things that most people probably won't ever think to do, you know. So it's very, very interesting. I can talk about Kanye West all day. Um, He's easily one of my biggest influencers from a production standpoint. I love sampling. I love the pitched up voices. I love chops. And I think that he is honest to God, one of the best samplers that we'll probably ever see. The things that he's able to do with a sample, um, and the ideas that he gets with it are amazing. And he, you know, he's from the Midwest. And I always say that the Midwest does it the best. So Yes, they do. Yeah, yes, they do. <laughs> Um, but you were speaking about how a lot of engineers face um, like depression and the hard times. I, I think that really like just the fact that somebody can because it's I don't want to say that singing or writing music is, is easier, easier in comparison. But the technicalities that come with the production, just me trying to produce a podcast, it's way more freaking difficult than I thought it would be. And music has got to be on a completely different level. And you could put your heart and soul into something for forever. And like you said earlier, it could fall apart on no fault of your own. So that has to be something that just is crushing to some people. And like you said, you can get paid like $500 for a beat that turns into a $5 million song. Like that's, that's something that, you know, I again, the as you get older, awesome. you realize those things. Hmm. 
the, the scale with that is off. I would hate to get paid $500 yeah. to you know, work for three hours knowing that the same person I was in the room with working just made $5 million while they were asleep. And now I can't go to sleep because I had to you know, do the same thing again. But it's, it's, a lot of times it's because you know, the engineers don't get paid royalties for their work. But yeah, they, they definitely have a, they go through it a lot. And they get treated bad. You know, there's videos online of engineers getting slapped and thrown food at them. Honestly, God, that was one of the things that made me not want to be somebody's engineer. Because I'm not somebody, I can't take that. I'm, we're going to have to fight. And there's no reason why I should be being creative and want to fight somebody. Because creation is very soft. You know, it makes you soft hearted. Mm-hmm. I should be okay with being soft hearted and creative while I'm creating. I don't want to have to worry about somebody throwing food at me because they don't understand what I'm doing. You know, a lot of times it's not even the engineer's fault. It's that the artist can't comprehend. No, not to any fault of their own. But they, they think it's supposed to be like this, or they're impatient, or, you know, mm-hmm. honestly, off of drugs. Like, you never know why artists act the way they do, but uh, I don't think that engineers should, they shouldn't take any type of abuse, but they really shouldn't take any physical abuse, you know. But um, yeah. my heart goes out to engineers, but I cannot be one. I couldn't be somebody's engineer. I learned to record who I like working with, but I, I couldn't do it. Uh, it's, it's, it's stressful. It's a very, very stressful job. I'd rather take anybody else's stress than a recording engineer because you have to work fast, you have to be on point, and you have to take the BS that somebody throws at you. And if somebody gives me BS, I'm throwing it right back at them. I, I'm not prepared mm-hmm. to you know, bite my tongue. That's not the person I am. So I, you know, I need to put myself in safer situations to not, so I, I don't react negatively, negatively to negativity. You know, but yeah, engineers and their mental health um, is is something that I, I hope I can help uh, bring more light to and, and help them get better. You know, because a lot of them don't know what they go through. They, they know how they feel. But I grew up thinking that how I felt about things was normal, whether it was right, wrong or indifferent. My perception was that if I went through this, it was normal. And so I learned that it, it either was or wasn't. So, you know, I'm hoping that we can have more conversations with engineers to bring the light, you know, what's going on so they can see, you know, whether or not what they have going on is normal or not normal and be able to um, really talk about it and address it. I learned that a lot of times it's just the conversation that actually makes everything a lot better. I held one event because we were supposed to do the event, the, the pandemic hit, it was supposed to be an in-person event. And we when we did it, we really couldn't figure out anything aside from Zoom. And I remember these engineers just being so thankful that people were, we were having a conversation about it. You know, it was engineer to engineer. We had a, a life coach or a mental health coach come in and kind of give us some tips and tricks. But a lot of people were just happy to talk about it because we didn't know that other people went through these same things. No one wants to share a horror story. You know, we kind of keep those things to ourselves. So we don't know that. You know, our peer just went through something similar. We can share the same experience, but I'm hoping that it gets a lot better. I think that it will because of how we're recording music now. You know, a lot of times it's at home. Um, artists are recording themselves as well too, but uh, the, the the health of, of the engineers is crucial. Even you know, away from how they get treated, just. I, I couldn't work on a big song and uh, not be paid the same way, knowing that my job is the reason why you sound like this. So what a lot of people don't know is the reason why your favorite artist sounds that good, it's not because the artist sounds that good. Their engineer is that good. You know, and it's the engineer that's creating the sonic. And I, I would probably be going through it if I you know, worked on a very big song but my role was downplayed or my paycheck wasn't as adequate that I knew that I'm the reason why it sounds like this or the reason why that beat drop is right there or you know, whatever the case is because, you know, I remember um, I was talking to uh, one, one, a really big engineer and he was you know, I wanted to be like him. I was like, man, this guy is great. I want to follow his steps. He, he was giving me great points and we were in a group chat and I remember him saying that 
He said, you know, y'all think it's all fun to work with who I work with. He said, but y'all don't realize that I had if I get a call at four in the morning and he wants to record and he's in Paris, but I'm still in Atlanta, I have to go to Paris at four in the morning. And that sounds cool until you don't feel like getting on a plane. Like, why are you going to record somebody in Paris? You couldn't find another engineer there. Because, you know, you're at will to that artist. He said, you know, that, that's not fun. It's fun the first couple of times because it looks cool. But eventually, when you're working and you're tired, you want to go to sleep. You don't want to get on the plane because somebody wants to record. You know, that's goofy. And that's that a hard life. Kind of got stuck. Yeah, it's, it's very tough. You know, everybody thinks because you're around the person that you're cool. And when in reality, you're probably getting whooped by work. And that was the point where I said, you know what? Let me step away from, you know, trying to be somebody's recording engineer because I want to still be able to do what I want to do. You know, I don't want somebody to call me. I'm at will to them. You know, hey, Joe, I'm in, I'm in Paris. You know, I need you to come record me. I don't want to go to Paris right now. It's cool. I might want to go vacation there, but I don't want to just fly out there to work and then have to work the same way I do, you know, for 12 hours, you know, 18 hours a day, sometimes 24, depending on how many artists are there and, and still had to get the job done. You know, it can be very hectic, but, you know, it can also be very rewarding. But I did learn that uh, being a recording engineer was not for me, even though I love recording, but I, I could not deal with that career type. It's way too stressful. Um, and I, I believe in smart business. So, you know, when you're making music, music is a forever product. It makes money for forever. As long as somebody plays it, you're making money. I want a part of the forever money. I don't want to get paid hourly when I'm working on a, a product that creates constant income over and over and over again. You know, so I, I definitely pass on the engineering career, but I, I, I want to help them out. And I'm still learning on how to, but, you know, sometimes it's just about asking them, hey, bro, how's your headspace going? Are you okay? A mental health check. Are you good? You know, I had an engineer call me one time. He was, he's a cat from New York. You know, in Atlanta, Atlanta from New York, they talk different. And uh, he's Jewish. And, you know, he was, he was a Jewish cat that was around a bunch of black people. So, you know, Atlanta was home. Like, right home saying. Yeah, you know. And I remember he called me crying. He said, bro, I just got out of a session and these rappers call me racist and they call me white boy and they call me all these names that I just don't understand. Like, why are they like this here? Because he knew I was from Michigan, so that you know Atlanta was new to me too. And he said, Bro, he said, Bro, you know I'm not a racist. He said, They call me racist because Pro Tools, the software that we use to record, crashed. So he can't, you can't make Pro Tools crash. If it crashes, it crashed because it crashed. You can't purposely do that, you know? And that, to have an engineer call me because that was messing with his head so bad and he couldn't shake it off on top of whatever else they were saying to him, I know that spoke volumes to you know the, the way they get treated. I had another engineer call me one time. And luckily, I had worked with this artist before. So I was able to tell him, like, hey, this artist is really just... Uh, I'm trying to think of a proper word to say. The artist is just not... He's not who you want to work with. You know, he, he he runs his mouth too much. He's not a um, he's mean. That's a better way to put it. This artist is a mean artist, so you have to understand that he's just mean. And he, he, he read a group chat. Hey, I have this artist who's being difficult. So every every engineer, these are you know very uh, skilled engineers. They're giving all throwing out tricks like, hey, do this, try this, just to mess with the artist's mind to make the to make him comfortable. You know, a lot of times in a session, the artist goes, oh, I don't like my voice. And then you take all the effects off, and then he hears himself, and then he really hates his voice. And you put them back on, he's happy again. And it's just about knowing that something changed. You know, it's a lot of psychology that goes on into mm -hmm. making your artist happy when you record. So we're giving him psychology tips to get his artist's brain comfortable. He said, bro, he, uh, I'm using his, his template. So this is what he always records, though. He always sounds like this. But he doesn't like it. And so we said, oh, he doesn't like you. So you have to, to bypass everything and, and do this. And, and But he's just testing you out right now. So I said, you know, where is he from? So the, the guy messaged me in a separate group chat. He said, oh, bro, he's from Atlanta. He said, this is his name. I said, oh, bro, so don't take anything that he says to heart. Because he did the same thing to me the other day. I said, but he, like, this guy tried to 
he didn't try to get physical with me, but he said some things to me that I think because I was sitting down, he thought that I was smaller than him. And I stood up. He's like, oh, no, bro, no problem. They're cool because, you know, I'm not, I'm not a regular you know, engineer. I don't have time for mess. I can't even work. Because I never met him before. So I said, brother, don't take what he's doing to heart. You know, he's mean and just kind of just let it be. He said, bro, little baby was in the room. I said, what does that have to do with anything? He said, this artist was going back to little baby and saying, oh, bro, the engineer sucks. His engineer isn't good, yada, yada, yada. So you have an engineer who's already underneath the pressure of little babies in the back of the room. Just that alone, especially when little baby is your favorite artist. So on top of him being little baby, he's your favorite artist. He's in the back of the room watching you work. Then you have an, another artist coming in, you know, talking bad about you. I'm, this engineer said, bro, I was questioning if I was a good engineer or not. I, he said, I almost stopped engineering because I had felt so bad. And this guy had made me feel like I just wasn't able to do my job. And I thought that was ridiculous. That made no sense to me that somebody can make somebody feel that bad and they're that good at their job to, to like, just, it took a three-hour session for this engineer to question eight years of work because one person made him feel bad. And I know I don't think that that's okay to uh, be, you know, be like that. You know, it is you have to check in on the engineers to make sure that they do because they go through things like that almost every day sometimes, depending on how, how often they're working and who they're working with. So you know, it, when I had those two situations that to me were very major because of how distraught these engineer these engineers were, it made me want to um, talk about it more to see what what else I can do, you know. Because the other thing is that in both situations, and this is easier said than done, but they could have just brushed it off. You know, they could have ah, whatever, don't care. And their mentals would have been fine. But because of the stressors around them and all the other things that go on with being an engineer, that also was just another layer on top of all the other layers that just you know, build up pressure and stress the out. And when you stress, your mental goes. So, you know, uh, I, I didn't mean to rant about that either. But I can talk no, about no, that. no. No, <laughs> that, that, I, I would have never even thought about stuff like this. Um, like, I, I I don't know what I imagined happened in, in the studio with the engineers, but I, I would not never have imagined that artists would go in and just be just rude to them and belittle them in front of their favorite artists just like that it's, it's a hierarchy thing um you know I, I, well, one thing i learned about so I, I have a hard time calling myself an artist because nah you can uh, call i was listening to you today you you are definitely an artist <laughs> I, I appreciate it. The, the one thing that um i always look for an artist and, and i say this in the most positive way possible but I, I always look for a sense of it's all about me because you want an artist to always be about them. An artist who's always about them will never let anything mess up because they're all about them. But sometimes when it's the wrong person and the artist doesn't you know, keep the humbleness or you know, they don't understand everything, the all about me can become very vindictive, out of spite. It can become negative, angry because it's all about them. They don't care about any casualties and what they're saying or doing. You know, but I do believe that artists should always be about them because those are the, you know, the ones that come off as divas, you know, and that's what you want when you're looking at a star. You want somebody who, you know, not full of themselves, but like Mariah Carey, all about her. Not, not in a bad way, but the reason why she's big is because she's all about her. But when it gets, when that trait gets put with a bad person, you have these instances where, you know, because it's all about them, if the artist felt like smacking the engineer, that's exactly what he did, you know, because it's all about him. So, you know, uh, yeah, I don't even know anymore. I'm just talking. <laughs> no, no, that, that's that's awesome. I mean, take really the best, the best artists, really the best any profession in general, but really something like that um, where you need creativity, which would require introspection. And a lot of times people that can achieve that at the highest level take like a level of ownership that on the outside, if someone doesn't have that same mentality, they can see it as like manic or like this person's a diva or something like, but it's just somebody who's like, who knows what they want and may not be able to articulate it in the way that 
the the other person can respond to effectively but it's it's how they feel and and in a bad person it's not going to manifest itself very well it's going to look ugly but um yeah um all right so i have another question for you this is way off track okay what would you say your favorite conspiracy theory is that you believe a hundred percent like you put your tinfoil hat on it's three in the morning you're looking at the person next to you is like hey bro honestly all of them that's what i like to hear <laughs> that that's what all i like them, to hear you know, um it's, it's it's very interesting so the as a kid i watched every conspiracy theory video on youtube you know you know, I, I believe that we did 9-11. I believe that Elvis Presley is you know, still alive, that we did not go to the moon, that COVID-19 was given to us through the, the way. Like, anything that I hear that sounds like a conspiracy, I, tr- I try to make the most sense out of it. And I, I believe most of them. Um, because one thing that I learned a lot through the music industry was how much entertainment and politics Come together to run the world. And entertainment is used to hide and, and to uh, to blind people. You know, it's, it's a show. So if there's a show going on. You have no idea what's going on in the back with the politics. You know. So I believe all the conspiracies because a lot of the things that I, people said, oh, that's not true. I found out it was true. Mm-hmm. You know. So I'm like, uh, if this was, if I seen this on YouTube as a kid. And it's not as absurd and crazy as it sounds. And then I get here and I'm saying that it is true. The rest of them must be true, too. You know, people aren't saying these things because they're crazy. They have some kind of information that, um, that, that, they, that they have. I think the one that I believe as a recent, and I don't even know if I can call this a conspiracy. Now, I'm not a Trump supporter. I'm also not a Joe Biden supporter. I do think there's probable cause that Trump did win the election. I think there's a huge conspiracy um, against him because of how he operates, but also in favor of, um, I don't even know who these people are, but if you look at, at the history of the U.S. from since Obama, so Obama's the president for eight years. When he wins, he picks his vice president president candidate to be Joe Biden, Joe Biden's wife went on Oprah and said that he had the option. Now, she wasn't supposed to say this because she got in a lot of trouble for telling this because well, for whatever reason, we weren't supposed to know. But Joe Biden's wife goes on Oprah and says, oh, yeah, Barack called Joe and said that he could either be the secretary of state or he would be or he could be the vice president, whichever one he doesn't pick, Hillary Clinton gets. So to me, that's a, you know, that sounds like, oh, Joe had an option. And then you fast forward, you know, 12 years now going on 13, Obama wins, Joe Biden is the vice president, Hillary Clinton is secretary of state, then Obama is now out of office, Joe Biden doesn't run, then Hillary runs, she loses. We have Trump. And then the first person that goes to run that they can think to put in after Trump is Joe Biden. So had... um, had whoever runs this had it their way, they would have had Obama, Hillary, and then maybe Joe again. Or they would have had Obama, Joe, Hillary. It would have been these same three people. You know, so we have somebody who's the president right now that used to be the vice president. You know, I think the only thing that got in the way of Joe Biden running was that he needed time to recover from some personal things. You know, I think he had lost his son. Being the vice president isn't an easy job. You know, so I couldn't imagine being in the White House for 16 years. Because eight years with Obama, Obama's entire face changed after 18 years. So 16 years of doing it, I don't know if I can do that one. You know? Yeah, um, so I, but I think that I think that there is a, a conspiracy for, I'm not even going to say for good reason. I don't like Trump. The only thing I like about Trump is that he's honest. But I, I think there was a, a, some conspiracies to get him out of office because, because of the kind of politician he wasn't. You know, um, every industry has its rules that we, we secretly abide by. You know, if you're a music producer, you do and you don't do this. That's just moral code. Same thing for politicians. There's a, a politician moral code. If you want to get this done, you do it like this. Trump did not abide by any of those moral codes. 
So even though you have Republicans that agreed with Trump, they didn't agree with how he went to do those things because it went against you know, the Constitution or how they would normally do things as a politician. So I think they wanted him out because Trump showed us how powerful a president can be you know, when they're corrupted or, or when they um, kind of just do whatever they want. And I think that really uh, a lot of people didn't like that. You know, um, I think the next conspiracy that I'll probably believe, I think Kamala is going to be the president next. I don't think that Joe would do eight years. I think he'll do four, and then we'll see her in the, in the office. You know, a big part of the reason why I don't like Joe Biden is because he. Um, now, I love the fact that we have a vice, a black woman as a vice president. I think that is a great figurehead, and I think that's great representation. But the reasoning why is not good. A lot of people don't know that Joe Biden's money comes from the jail systems. So who does he pick to be his vice president? A woman who has locked up the most people in California. Because that's helping his money out. You know, whenever she sends somebody to jail, he gets paid because our, our, our prison systems are private. And again, when she, be, when she becomes president, these people that are making these choices, they had Obama for eight years, they messed up and lost Trump because they had Trump for four. They had Biden for another eight, Kamala uh, Biden for another four, Kamala for eight years. They're, they're getting this system going. But the reason why I don't like Biden is because the moment he got Camilla as his vice president, every campaign had a black face in it. I didn't even see a white person in his campaign commercials um, after he announced her as the vice president. And Joe Biden is a white guy, so you would assume that you've seen, you know, white people in his campaign. I like that I see more black people, but it was almost too purposeful. You know, it, it was too too much. Like we know what you're trying to do here, and. Uh, I don't know. It, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way to see how how we, we're learning and, and entertainment too. It really comes from entertainment culture, but how we're learning to abuse um, the power of black people. You know, we've seen it firsthand with Obama that if black people come together, we'll, we'll make it happen. Even though we only make up thirteen percent of the nation. Same thing with culture. If black people say it's cool, it becomes cool eventually. And I think we're getting to a point where, where we are abusing that and. We have to grow awareness. So, you know, I thought Joe was a cool dude um, when he was with Obama. But the more and more I began to study and the more and more I, I see the entertainment part of the politics. And, like, you know, I understand commercials because I know people that make commercials. So I, I know what they're putting in them. And I'm like, ah, all these black faces, because you want us to subconsciously see that, you know, you're a person of the black people. And I, I get it. It's cool, but it's an overkill. Which means you're not doing it for the right reasons. So, uh, to answer your question, I believe every conspiracy. Um, I think my favorite conspiracy that no one believes me in is 9/11. Um, that's the to me. I, I think that conspiracy on the U.S. like takes the cake for um, conspiracy. It's, it's so it's so huge and it's so detrimental. It's so unfortunate. Um, but every president has to have their war and. Bush needed to start his, you know, and unfortunately that meant crashing into two towers. I think that, honestly, I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think we did that to ourselves because Bush, Bush, now, I love watching George Bush interact with people because he's kind of goofy. He's funny. And, you know, like, yeah, he's funny. He's funny to watch. But, you know, I don't think he was our smartest president. So there's a video of him where he's reading the kids. And the first tower had crashed. And there's only there's only been one only one camera ever caught the first plane crashing. That's because they were shooting a documentary and it just so happened to be in the background, you know, while they're shooting an interview. And a lady comes in to talk to Bush while he's talking to the kids. Hey, twin tower or one of the towers just got hit. And you can see that like, he doesn't make a face. He just she walks away, he keeps reading to the kids. Moments later, he comes back, hey, the second one got hit. This is a terrorist attack. We need to get you out. And he goes out or whatever. And then the Pentagon gets hit. One lands somewhere. And I think I think they might have like five things. I don't know. But when George Bush gives his uh, like, uh, the speech or he's debriefing, he goes, oh, I remember when I seen the first one hit. There's no way that George Bush seen the first one hit. There's footage of him reading the kids as the first one hit. And mm. the footage of the first one hit. The footage of the first one hitting was only caught by one person, and they didn't release that right away to people. 
because you know they probably released it later on that night, but not in that moment. So um, I think that uh, that's probably my favorite conspiracy. On top of the um, the Pentagon, when the Pentagon hit, how didn't the plane's wings do any damage to the Pentagon? Only the nose, you know. So that lets me know that so a lot of people have a theory that there were timed bombs and that when the plane hits, the bomb goes off or that the bomb makes it look like it. So when you look at the Pentagon's damage, there was no damage that indicated a massive plane had just crashed into it, it just a hole. But there's no wings, you know, like there's no indication that wings hit anything, which is crazy to me. And, you know, the one that the one part that I think somebody can have a little bit of room to say, like, um, is that this is false is one of the videos on the planes crashing the building uh, says fire like a millisecond before the plane actually hits but somebody could argue that that's just <clears throat> video lag per se or, or whatever you want to call it but uh, 9-11 was, is definitely my uh, the one that I just believe in because of how wrong it is you know, yeah. I do not believe that there, there were that many, um, that there were that that much of a need for war to do that to your own people. But people hate when I say that. I think is real. Um, another conspiracy that this isn't even a conspiracy, but the the reason why we're at we've been at war with all these other countries. You know, people don't understand the World Bank. The World Bank was created in the U.S. by I think it was thirteen. Congressmen or senators, or they were something, they were lawmakers. And, but they were all opposite. So, like the Democrat, Republican, <clears throat> they, at, at their day job of lawmaking, they go against each other. You know, they, they argue all the time. They came together for a retreat. They come up with some proposal for how the banking system should be. And they all, they all knew that they couldn't walk into their offices and already agree on this because it would. They would know that, you know, this is a setup of something because there's no reason you 13 people should be coming to us with one idea. So they all came up with the idea. They gave it to one person to pitch, and the other 12's job was to convince their people to vote for it. So they did that, and now we have the world banking system. Well, those 13 people that benefited from it benefited from, like, their kids are still eating off of this uh, system, per se. and when you, when you look at the countries that we're at war with, like Iran, Iran doesn't have a world bank. You know, so of course, well, you got to think: Why would we care how another country runs their country? Why, like, why, why are we going to go to war with you because you, you don't have a democratic system? Why, why does that matter to us so much? Well, if you had a democratic system, you need a world bank. So we're going to go to we're not we're not at war because of the the, the democratic system or Whatever the case is, we're at war because we can't control your money. We don't have a world bank in there, so we want to get that in there. Um, yeah, I could talk about this all day long. But, yeah, uh, I hadn't it, actually heard that much about the World Bank one. That's 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 really interesting. I actually only learned it because. Um, so I'm not a money person. You know, I, I I never grew up being told that money was important. My parents raised me that if you work, you get money. You take care of whatever you want to take care of, but. Um, my parents taught me to be of service to people, you know, and I was watching some YouTube videos tr trying to educate myself on money. And I watched a documentary on the World Bank, just kind of going through a rabbit hole of videos. And I learned that and I thought that was very uh, manipulative and kind of smart on those 13 men's behalf to, to say, hey, let, let's do this idea that's going to benefit us. But we can't say that it's our idea. It's one person's idea, and we'll convince everybody else to agree with it, <clears throat> and we'll only benefit in the in the on the back end or in the background behind the scenes. Um, I think that I think that's how a lot of things go. You know, people who you don't think work together work together, and then when it's out in public, they go, "Okay, you know, let's not tell anybody that this is our idea. You know, let's just keep this in the back. Let's just get the money off of it. Let's not be the, the face card for it." Um, but it's very interesting. I know there's a lot of details that I've left out about that, but that kind of changed my perspective a lot on the 
things that go on in the world. It's all about money control. Um, yeah. Especially. Any conspiracy theory regarding the music industry? The one that I do not believe, um, only because of this, and I, I found a pattern. <clears throat> so I do believe that all the Illuminati, thing, not all the things, but Illuminati, I don't think it's called Illuminati, but that higher power is definitely real. Because so many of these things are planned. The one thing that I don't believe that um, I thought somebody made a very, very valid point is you always see that we have, it's always the black artist that's a part of the Illuminati. And, and we never see it too much about the white artist. And I think that's a, those theories come out of um, trying to make black people look bad. Like, you know, why do we think that Beyonce is the Illuminati and not Taylor Swift? Or, you know, it, or why is it Beyonce, Jay-Z, Kanye? Like, I just always see more black names than white names on this Illuminati list. And I remember talking to, um, he's a doctor, he's a Freemason, actually. He's in a Freemason. I don't know if, so some people think that being a Freemason is a cult. So some people call it a fraternity. But well, they were, Mason. the Freemasons were a sect of a, um, a previous, like, secret society sort of mm -hmm. thing in uh i think it was germany they uh a guy uh went to germany saw it and then made like a version of it over here in uh, the states so so i was talking to a doctor who was a freemason and <clears throat> i forgot exactly what he said but he said uh, black people can't be in this upper echelon they don't have enough there's not a black person in America that has enough money to to do so. So the question is, why do we think that it's a you know, it's Beyonce or it's Diddy compared to the one the people that we cannot see? And so to me, that's what kind of debunked it was that these people that we're saying are, are they're in it. The closest to being in it they are are puppets that they run it. Absolutely not. It's not even possible because the money inside of it goes so far back to um, money that, unfortunately, black people, we're just now getting the opportunity to have. We don't have old money. You know, these people, yeah. you know, they, they own New York. They own skyscraper land buildings, oil and things like that. Like, this goes so far back. And so the one that I do not believe is the one that says that all the major black artists are part of the Illuminati. <clears throat> I do believe that higher society is real, um, but everything else is true. You know, I, there's a lot of weird things that go on. You know, even when you look at, uh, I, mean, I think the best one is Dave Chappelle. Actually, not his his conspiracy, but his truth. So he he was on a on Oprah, and he talked about how he had to you know, doing some movie. And he goes into his trailer that there's a dress there. He was like, you know, my contract said nothing about putting a dress on. But, but he knew exactly what that was. So the theory is that Hollywood, and they say that they do it with mostly black men, but there's evidence of them doing it with just men in general. But that they'll put a man in a dress to uh, demasculate them. Or to, and for, for the person itself, it's, it's humiliation. But for the subconscious of the viewer, it demasculates men. So he said, I knew exactly what this was. I had a dress in my, in my trailer. I knew that it had to be, you know, this. And he goes, I'm not putting the dress on. The the writer comes in. And Dave told Oprah, he said that he knew if the writer had different props to get him in the dress, he knew that it had nothing to do with the movie. And it was just, you know, one of these setup things. He said, he told the writer that he's not wearing the dress. He goes, oh, Dave, it's going to be funny. He's going to be great. You do it like this. He goes, oh, I can't do this because of that. The writer had another reason why he, he should put him in a dress. Dave debunked that reason, had another reason why. So this writer's goal wasn't to you know, get the movie to be the best movie. It was to get Dave in a dress by any means possible. Dave didn't put that dress on, and he had to, like, thank God he was able to come back and have the career that he has now. But mm -hmm. they He's wrote him off, comment. you know, they, yeah, they wrote him off and called him whatever, and he had to really get it back from the ground up independently. 
So another thing is that I'm very glad that we're in a, a independent stage of entertainment for the most part because it alleviates things like that. You know, if this is 15 years ago, Dave Chappelle does not need to make a comeback because there's there's no he has, doesn't have access to the way that the internet is now. He can't be independent. You know, you have to follow these you know unwritten rules and guidelines. So. <clears throat> I'm very glad that Dave Chappelle was able to make his comeback. The same thing happened with Cat Williams. It was Cat Williams wasn't addressed. I can't remember what his was, but I don't know if you, you remember the time where you thought that Crack uh, Cat Williams was a crackhead. He wasn't a crackhead. He had made somebody mad, you know, and he had they had they were able to um, publish anything about them, you know the the. Uh, I can't call this a conspiracy theory, but Michael Jackson, you know, they tried to frame him as a child molester and a predator in the media. And this was honest. This is honestly got one of the biggest lessons that I've ever learned in terms of how it actually all works. So as a kid on Michael Jackson, I'm like, man, why do they keep saying that this guy, you know, hurts kids the wrong way? Like, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. And how is he not in jail if he really does so? And how can't you, you know, he's been on trial twice for it and he beats it. And the second trial, I remember as a kid watching the second trial adamantly because the first one was 1996. That's when I was born. The second one was like 2004 or something. I don't know. I remember watching it and this jury was actually stacked against him and he won. Doesn't make any sense. But and they're still printing out articles of Jackson is this, Jackson is that. And it didn't make any sense as to how somebody can do all of this and not be in jail. So then reports came out through the FBI that so they followed Michael Jackson. For, I think they said for seven years to 13 different countries or something like some ratio like that. His phones were tapped. They heard, excuse me, they heard every conversation. They said he's a victim of extortion and yada, yada, yada. They said that they found no proof that he had ever harmed a kid, but that he was being extorted. So then I wondered, why are you printing all these things about Michael Jackson? And what people don't know is that Michael Jackson actually owned half of Sony, which meant that he owned a quarter of the music industry. So he owned half, he owned Sony's publishing, uh, Sony ATV. He owned their publishing company. And he bought it for $90,000 back in the 90s or 80s, and that wasn't that was so when he buys it, that gives him rights to everybody's music. So like when Beyonce released a song through Columbia, that Columbia's publisher was Sony. He made money off of Beyonce making music. So between him making all that money as a businessman and then all the money he made as an artist, and he wanted to begin to go against um, all of those things, it, it made you know, his peers mad. So the one thing that Michael Jackson didn't own was news outlets, and they wanted Michael Jackson to sell the um, his rights, and he wouldn't. He, he, his part of the company, and he wouldn't sell it. So because he won't sell it, and he's not making the music that that they want him to make, like this is when I don't want to. Uh, they don't really care about us. They don't want him to make that song. So we think that song is normal because you know, we have it. But in the '90s, you can't say those things. You know. You, you, they don't want you to. It's too out there. It's too okay, you know. And uh, so because of that, they gunned for him. They did all these things to break him, so that he could try it, so they could sell. Oh, hey, you just cut out. I can't hear you. Let me let me see something here. Shoot, let me. Okay, sorry about that. We had a little bit of some technical issues, uh, but uh, we're back. We're back. So you know, uh, I, I learned that you know, in Michael Jackson's situation, where he was kind of doing too much. You know, he was a very powerful person in the music industry and and, and in entertainment, and going against you know his peers creatively. So while he's this great businessman because he owned a quarter of the music industry's music, he was he was also a creator. Sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. 
my girlfriend's having a party outside. It's her birthday. Oh, but shoot. Well, th- thank you for spending this time with me on her birthday. <laughs> One second. Uh, it's so interesting that they love uh, English music here. I don't think it's some. It's always it's something different. We all people always gravitate to something different. Like uh, you were saying earlier, that uh, a lot of people listen to uh, English music over there. I I don't not a lot, but I listen to a little bit of some Spanish music, and I don't understand yeah. a word that they're saying, <laughs> and I I love it. <laughs> but you know, I'm sorry. To, to wrap up this Michael Jackson story, he owned a lot. He owned too much of the music industry and creatively was going against what because when you're when you're, when you're a side artist sometimes you don't get an option in what you create you know so because he wanted to gain his own control of his own music and he controlled other people's music it was too much um he became too much of a threat same thing with bill cosby you know the, the reason why now i don't I actually don't have an opinion on whether or not I thought Bill Cosby did what he did or didn't do, but I think it's too much of a coincidence that he he goes to jail for these things, and we have somebody like Harvey Weinstein who has never seen jail, and there are there's proof of that Harvey Weinstein did what he did, but there's, there's no coincidence that Bill Cosby, around the time that he could go into jail, he was trying to buy one of the major networks, one of the major TV networks. And it would have made him <clears throat> the only black owner of a major TV network. And mm. everybody around him told him, don't do it. Because they know that they, well, the moment you... So there's this thing where you can't say no to money. So because Bill Cosby had enough money, there's no there's no reason why they can't give it to him. So instead of not instead of not giving it to him, they make it so that he can't have it by putting him in jail. Or they send him a lesson, you know. Um, and the lesson is, you know, going to jail, like, you know, don't try to do this. So there are reports that a lot of Bill Cosby's friends and colleagues, hey, bro, you shouldn't do this. It could be very dangerous. He doesn't care. He tries to push forward with it. And he goes to jail for crimes that may or may not have happened 30 years ago. Same thing with, uh, with Chris Brown. You know, he, so Chris Brown, and Chris Brown's the most recent, and this was the most, like, um, like this, the music industry had lost this battle with the artist. And they look, it kind of looked very goofy. So Chris Brown's contract is up with RCA. And he he tells his label, I'm assuming this because of how it went. Either you can let me go and you know I'll be an independent artist or I'll stay with you guys, but I need the ownership to all my masters. So they chose to, of course, you got to keep Chris Brown on the label. But they gave him the rights to all his masters, which means that if Chris Brown doesn't want to put the song out, you know, 20 years later, he, doesn't have, he can take the song down. If he owns the rights to move this, these songs around. And that was a huge hit to, to the that record label because you don't want your artist to be able to do that. Because that means that if, say, one, one executive makes Chris Brown mad, Chris Brown can stop, you know, the 25th anniversary of Off the Wall, not Off the Wall, Wall to Wall. He could not put that out. And the, the best thing about music is that it's a forever product so that you can um, you have the ability to re-put out the music and make more money off of it years later or put it in commercials. But if Chris Brown owns his masters and he doesn't like his label, he can choose to not do that. And that's stopping their money. So um, what happened was he, he beats the label and they give him his, his masters. What they do, because they're so mad at him for even thinking, you know, being smart enough to do it, do what he did, they they hit him with fake rape allegations in Paris. Now, where whoever set this up went wrong is that the girl that they said he raped came out the next day and said, yo, like, I was with Chris this night, but we were never alone. And I don't really know him like that. He never touched me. Nothing ever happened. So he's out of jail within a week or three days or something. But uh, that was, uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that he, there's a fake allegation that they, that the girl drops herself because it is not true right around the time where he wins his matches back from his record label. So, you know, it's a, a lot of things that go on um, that I believe I could talk about conspiracies all day long. But Yeah, I, I love it, man. I, I love I love my conspiracy theories. It, it's, a, it's a lot that goes on. And, and some of the things that, that I, 
Mm-hmm. I'm able to research, mm-hmm. find out, hear firsthand from people. It makes me just believe that it's mm-hmm. all true. You have to be- believe it. If somebody can say that this crazy thing happened and they can connect the dots, mm-hmm. it's a very good possibility that, you yeah. know, it, it's like that, you know, because we live in a world that everything and everybody isn't good. Mm-hmm. They're actually more bad people than good people. So why mm-hmm. would I believe that everything is just as sweet that it, that it comes across? Sometimes if it's too good to be true, it's not true. You know, and a lot of these things that we see in the world are kind of too good. The system is too perfect. It's not good as bad, you know? Yeah. I, it really speaks to how a lot of times, uh, we'll take these people and we'll idealize them and build them up to be this, you know, whatever they get built up to be. And then the first opportunity we get, we love to tear them down. Um, whether the reason is justifiable or not. Um, man, I, I could, you know, this, this isn't a conspiracy theory, but it's actually not, I don't, I, it's, it's too soon. And the way I, the way I feel about it, I don't, I don't, it's, I know I can't articulate it the right way. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about this, that maybe off the podcast, but, um, yeah. All right. I'm getting texts from my family saying that I need to, to come out so they can start to do stuff. Yeah, um, man, but I really. I, I, they're doing a mic check right now. So this is hilarious. Yeah. Brazilians party hard, bro. Like, yeah. Her family about to come up, all her friends, they got, they rented tables. The, people are bringing instruments. There's a karaoke machine out there. Man, PSA I can't, table. I can't keep you from that. <laughs> I cannot keep you from that. Um, okay. Uh, I'm Dominic Mills here with Joe Lewis, extremely talented musical genius, great Thanks. guy. Make sure to check his music out. You can find him on Spotify, uh, Apple Music too. Um, yeah, everywhere. Every, everywhere you can find music and be prepared for his show to come out in the future. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate thank you. you. No, thank you for having me. I definitely enjoyed this podcast. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Dominic Mills podcast. Please make sure to follow the show on your favorite podcast directory so you never miss an episode. Links to the news stories and Joe's work will be included in the notes.